The Negro Speaks of Rivers by Langston Hughes. I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood in human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawn was young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans, and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient, dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. Wonderful. Oh my God, I'm so moved by that. Um, so um, please help me welcome uh, actor, teaching artist, and arts coordinator for artists in prison programs, Wayne Cook. I'm just going to do a little applaud before we get started. Uh, we're so happy to have you here, uh, Wayne. Uh, do you want to just speak a little bit about that piece and what that was like to record it? And I know you, you worked with a violinist. Uh, yeah, uh, that was part of a one-person show that I do of Langston Hughes. That's Vincent Gomez. He's a music teacher from uh, a Mountain View. He actually plays that right bass uh, for the continuation of the show. So uh, uh, that it moves me every time I hear it as well. So I'm glad you began this whole process with some art. <laughs> I'm going to try to do that throughout because with the transitions, because really that's what it's about. It's getting, making, if we want to talk about this fully, we have to talk about getting arts education in the schools. What does that look like, you know, and why is that so important? Mm -hmm. um, uh, actually, we have a piece that I think we're going to share we didn't share it at the top, but uh, we'll share it after you and I are finished talking. Okay. Uh, something from uh, California Arts, a video which which really speaks to what we're doing. Okay. Yes. Let's yes. get started with our, our conversation. Uh, we thought it would be better to do it this way than have you just be a talking head for 20 minutes. Uh, so um, could you please share with us your trajectory and how it led you in into and through the career as an arts educator? Yeah, pretty amazing. And it's actually, after really thinking about that question, it, it, it really has led me backwards and it really comes through psychiatry, actually. Um, I was not involved in theater until I got involved, I got went to the military and there were six, people, six soldiers of us went to Fort Sam Houston to study social work. And because we were there early, we went through three programs, social work, psychology technician, 
and testing. And after that, we got assigned a psychiatrist somewhere in the world. And I got assigned to a Dr. Brown in Landstuhl, Germany. And in Landstuhl, Germany at this clinic, there was also a child psychiatrist there, a play therapist. And his, he was pretty famous and his name was Dr. Hudson. And he had a play therapy room. And so I continued my studies about play therapy with children. And that was really where this whole thing about working uh, with children and working in, um, with materials. And, and there also, I got involved in theater. I was not involved in theater until I went to the military. There was an organization, there was a person there that started what we call the borderline players. So all of this started to come to be. And, and, and uh, so there was, we continued my studies of psychiatry and also with Dr. Hudson and Dr. Brown. By the way, Dr. Dr. Brown stuttered, but he still was a, a, a great psychiatrist. And Dr. Hudson was a 300 pound, amazing uh, child psychiatrist in play therapy. And as anybody knows anything about play therapy, you know that you use a lot of creative dramatics and a lot of um, uh, drama uh, with, uh, in play therapy. And that's where I really learned my biggest lesson about working with children. And it happened at the very beginning of my process of working with children. Would you like me to tell you that story? Oh, please. Yeah, please. I'll tell it to you very quickly. Love but we, we had a play therapy room, which was an amazing place with all kinds of toys in it. And it came to my time to take this eight-year-old schizophrenic child who could speak, but who would not. And I said, I am going to be the first one, you know, like the teacher in the room. I am going to be the first one to make this child speak. I am going to make this child speak. So Dr. Hudson said, okay, it's yours. Take him, take him to the play therapy room. And off I go with this eight-year-old schizophrenic child into this play therapy room where an amazing, every toy you can think of, the child goes to the center of the room and sits down. And I said, I bet you, I bet you can't touch your nose. And I touched my nose. I bet you, bet you can't touch your ears. I grab every toy in the room. I'm running around and the child just sits there and looks at me. I bet you, I bet you can't do this. I bet you can't do that. I bet you can't touch your eyes. And there's every toy, everything there. This child exhausts me. And for 45 minutes did nothing but just look straight ahead, did absolutely nothing. And at the very end of that session, the child's parents come to get that child. And we had a long hallway in our psychiatric, psychiatric building. And the child and the parents take the child, they take the child all the way to the end of this hallway. And the child turns around and looks at me and goes, touches his nose. And <laughs> I could not believe it. And that was a lesson that says, you big dummy, for 45 minutes, you tried to force all this stuff on me. And all you needed to do was create a safe environment where I can grow and let me grow on my own and I will develop. And that was probably the best lesson that I ever had in terms of doing theater with children and doing creative dramatics with children and working with children in classroom. Let you you know, these, uh, to have that classroom, making sure it's a safe environment and let children develop it on their own, but creating some perimeters where they can grow on their own. So <laughs> that, that was an amazing story that Dr. Hudson and, and uh, play therapy has taught me. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, I, I always tell people, I usually say it during the introduction that had it not been for arts education in the school, I probably would not be here today because I have learning disabilities. I have learning disabilities. And uh, it was through arts education that I was able to find my voice and find my presence, you know? And so, but working with people like you, you know, to help us find that, you know, and, and uh, get grounded. Um, 
who, uh, well, you, you talked about some of the people that inspired you already, but is there anybody else that you could speak about that ha has helped you in terms of succeeding in arts education? Uh, yeah, there are so many people that really has, uh, really assisted me on the way. Many of these psychologists, psychiatrists, um, when I was, um, after college, I went to England and I had an opportunity to work with a guy named Brian Way. Mm -hmm. Some of those theater people out there may know of Brian Way. He developed a book called Development Through Drama. And it was a famous book, but I never knew how famous Brian Way was when I actually worked with him. We used to argue quite a bit about how to work with children and groups, you know, and, uh, uh, but he would travel all around the world in terms of development through drama. And he used lots of movement, lots of movement through uh, his work with students, bringing on speech later on and characterizations later on, but developing at the very beginning through the movement of the child, bringing out the movement and through movement, developing characters and through those characterizations come development through, you know, uh, a relationship. So the, Brian Way was really instrumental to uh, really helping me. Um, uh, uh, I get at least what direction I was going on with, with creative dramatics in theater. Isn't it true those people at the early time, you know, that really took our hand and guided us are the ones we, we remember the most, right? Yes, yes. Really do. Yeah, and then there's all kinds of other people coming back and going to the Pittsburgh Playhouse uh, in, in Pittsburgh and uh, all my teachers that uh, I, I worked with, and I, I also created a program in Pittsburgh uh, when I was working my way through, through college. I developed a program called Community Action Theater, and that was going to seven inner city communities and developing theater programs in those communities. And lo and behold, uh, that was when I had a, had a relationship, not really a relationship, but a at least a, a, a professional relationship with August Wilson. And I'm sure a lot of folks over there know who August Wilson was, but um, through people like that in Pittsburgh and all those, uh, this is during a time when, you know, I, I'm not sure whether we were going to make it as a society. If this is really in the, after 68 through 72, 73, there were all kinds of things going on. So that, that experience of working with those really influential people and um, uh, experimenting uh, through theater and experimenting going into the classrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, also at that time, there was a thing and it's called Model Cities where again, I was working my way through college. Mm -hmm. I was going to preschools and really taking that experiences that I had in psychiatry and, and also with Brian Way and working with our preschool students and doing what I can remember what was the real creative dramatics of going into a classroom and going to the classroom and letting the students really develop the session and uh, going with them instead of my placing upon them going along with them to develop the lesson, develop what creative dramatics was going to happen uh, with those students. So it was all of that stuff that really influenced me and really brought me together in terms of uh, actually going into a K-6, K-12 classroom and working with students in a, in a uh, systematic session. And you ended up uh, really, I mean, you're, you're um your journey has been very interesting because you've, you've worked in, you, you live in Sacra Sacramento, but you worked in Sacramento. Yes. Uh, and, and really uh, worked in coordinating uh, programming and all of that. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, well, I uh, went from, I went from Los Angeles uh, to Sacramento. I, in Los Angeles, there was, a, there was a person that really got me started in schools, and her name was Susan Campbell Tracy. <laughs> and, and through an organization called Performing Tree, which you have some people in Los Angeles who will remember that organization, again, 
taking artists and taking artists into schools and working in classrooms and developing programs. And from that organization, I went to the California Arts Council. But prior to that, I went to Folsom State Prison to develop an arts program at Folsom State Prison. And I was the first artist facilitator to develop a program at Folsom. But from Folsom, I went to the California Arts Council and became their arts and education coordinator at the, at the Arts Council. And for about 20 so years, really developed uh, arts, arts programs, working with schools, working with artists, uh, and um, looking at how we can develop those artists in classrooms and develop those artists uh, to deliver those services to schools at K-12 throughout the school system. Could you speak now a little bit to the, the work with the prisons? Because that's a whole different world, you know, like that from the classroom to the prison. And I know yeah. uh, we have um, uh, Sheila Scott Wilkinson that will be on one of our panelists from Theater of Hearts. And I know the work they do with incarcerated youth and, and, um, and, and, and it's wonderful. But, but are there any stories you could share about uh, working with the prisoners and what that has been like? Well, I can, I can share some stories that things you shouldn't do. <laughs> uh, the very first time of being, in, being at uh, Folsom, you know, the most important thing you should do is let everyone know where you are going at all times. And I can remember the warden saying, Wayne, make sure you let everyone know where you are. So the very first time going out into the prison by myself, we had a big band room. And I was excited to go down to the BAM room, but our BAM room was, was our hanging room, which was a big um, boulder, connected boulder. You could go in there and you could have a rock band play. And when you shut the door, you, nobody could ever hear you. So I can remember going down into, uh, into, the, insti into the institution, Folsom State Prison, and opening up the door and going inside and shutting the door and remembering that I did not tell anybody where I was. <laughs> so turning the bin and there were, there were many, many inmates inside who were playing music and my thinking that I was in lots of trouble, but then knowing that, you know, uh, what inmates and what uh, students want was the arts. And I was there to bring them the arts inside and so there was, there was no problem at all. And so I, you know, I think that there's many artists out there that are also they're going inside and bringing the arts to institutions. Mm -hmm. And we have now uh, a program uh, with uh, William James Association, which I am part of as well, that is sending artists into you know, uh, many institutions. And we have training, training programs that are training artists to go inside to work with uh, students. And we are just getting into this whole thing of how do we do distant learning mm -hmm. inside, which I know that you are going to talk about uh, um, uh, today as well. So there's, I, you know, I feel like I'm rambling because yeah. there's so many, so many different things that have, that has happened to, to me throughout my career and that I could really talk about. I mean, it's like, uh, just an, an amazing array to bring me around uh, to where I am. And I didn't even get to, you know, I did, I also wrote a book. I wrote a, a, a curriculum, uh, K-6, called Center Stage. Wow. That was adopted in Texas. And so about 86,000 teachers in Texas have, at the time, my curriculum, of uh, center stage, and that was adopted in 1992. So there's, you know, a theater, creative arts, so important uh, for what we do. Many artists out there are doing the same work. I applaud them. And there's many roads to what we do and many roads to how we accomplish what we do, but bringing it all in and, and how you, um, the road that you, that you take 
uh, to accomplish what you do is so so uh, makes you an individual in terms of uh, how you're going to deliver those arts to those students. And you know you, you're bringing up because we because I want to get into that conversation around uh, uh, with COVID nineteen and what that has created you know with the distant learning that we're doing which could be a great opportunity for a lot of people because uh, you know you can go right to them you don't have to worry about you know uh, the drive to and the drive from you know you you can go right there create that flexibility but uh, when you're working in in prisons. Uh, I would imagine there there would be some challenges with that kind of teaching. There are challenges and we're just learning about those now. We're just trying to figure out what is the best way. We're having workshops about what is the best way of distant learning and, and about uh, and about teaching. The artists right now are finding the best ways of uh, creating lessons. Mm -hmm. And so, so many institutions have so many different policies. The institution that I am working at, working with right now, uh, Solano, um, you have to send in lessons, you have to email lessons, get them a, a, um, approved, and then send the lessons in. And uh, the students then look at those lessons. And uh, by getting those lessons back out is a problem as well because of all the all the um, um, making sure of how you know uh, of what kind of information goes back out to the out out to the to the artists. So it's getting those that two way street going that we are now working with right now, and working with uh, each institution. It makes it uh, makes it a, makes it somewhat difficult because you know there's over thirty institutions. Uh, right. Yeah. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Yeah. But uh, it's amazing work, and uh, and I'm 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 sure that you're probably coming upon that right now with how how are these artists now going to work in this setting without actually seeing the students, huh? Right, and and you know one of the things that we're 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 dealing with uh, because we have a teaching artist program and. Uh, and we've never done it virtually before. So we have to teach it virtually, but we are also teaching, teaching artists how to teach virtually, you know, just some of the best, because we're, we're right now developing the best practices. It's not like, oh, here's the best practices. We're all learning right from it. So, you know, that really gets me into really talking about some of the traits that would be important for a teaching artist to have, some of the skills that are important, certainly, understanding your craft is important and and understanding um you know how to align everything with um uh the uh in our case the california art standards you know but but beyond that you know like that what are some of the things that are very into you that, that have helped you to be able to um be good at what you do flexibility is definitely uh, very, very important to uh, understand how one receives the the information that you that you are uh, attempting to give them. Uh, how working in groups very important to me is group learning how students learn in groups and how they participate in groups uh, when i did a lot of work with students i did a lot of group work and it was so important to uh, uh, look to see how they uh, receive this information and and work together the most important thing to me was to watch them how they uh, work with one another in groups and so uh, i i was so fascinated by watching how they solve these problems so as as the as the the administrator and as the teacher i was just fascinated to watch the students being able to uh, work with one another and to sense what direction they are going with one another. 
I, I think that um, as, uh, as an instructor, we have to know the material from the standpoint of, of, uh, of being able to uh, sense uh, what direction these, the, the, the students can go. And, um, I, you know, I, mean, I, I it's, there's so much, there's so much to it. I, I, I think that what we have to do is that we have to look at uh, um, the essence of, of the essence of theater and what what um, uh, uh, well you know I'm 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 kind of I'm kind of rambling right now because I I, I get a sense that uh, the uh, Ask me another quick question. No, no, that's fine. I think you, I think you answered it actually. I think you, you, you said what, what I wanted to hear. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure what, but, but I, I do want to say that, um, uh, you know, I think I, I was looking in the Q and A and I, and I noticed um, uh, a question that was, was in there about how people can get started uh, who, uh, who want to really do this and, and what, why I've always asked about trajectories is that it doesn't it doesn't just happen. You know, you get you yes. know you get your training and you do what you need to do, and then you get out there into the thing. Uh, what what's great ways for people to get started? Yeah, the best way to do is to volunteer, to volunteer in uh, any group that you can you can volunteer for groups of uh, students. I mean, I I did I can remember. I actually, I can remember my volunteering at, uh, at delinquent homes. I would thumb, you know what thumbing is? <laughs> you know, you go out into the highway and you thumb. I would thumb to a place called Thorn Hill and Thorn Hill was our delinquent home. Mm -hmm. And I would thumb to go out and use theater with uh, kids in delinquent homes. Wow. And because how important I, I knew theater was and how important it was for students to be able to, being able to work together and how important it was to them to really think about the kinds of activities that they are doing and the kinds of thought process that students, uh, that they are putting within a subject area. You know, so important for students to look at a subject area and to approach it from so many different angles. Mm -hmm. I think the problem solving, you know, the one important thing about our business and what we do is that we give students so many different ways to problem solve. And mm -hmm. if, if it wasn't for this, for what we're going through right now, I mean, creativity and problem solving, if it wasn't for that, I don't know what we would do. Right. I mean, we need to be able to problem solve so uh, so much. So being able to go to an, and volunteer in a group, and to pro and to give a group activity and watch how a, a, a group of kids problem solve to solve that problem, right. and that there's no right, there's no wrong, right? To solving it, but uh, given the opportunity to do that, I think that uh, that has really helped me. Uh, and so and you know the whole thing with remote work, you know, we're all kind of we're all pioneers in this, right? As I mentioned at the at pioneers, the, yes. Yeah, we're learning, you know, we just have to really be available to those ideas and what that yes. Is. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And um, I'm gonna look at some questions that are being okay. asked, uh, right now. Uh, on on if there's something there that we can talk about. Um, I've also studied with the actors gang. You know about the actors gang, right? Yes. So, that I help the leads and I lead girls and all of that. So we're get, getting people responding to that kind of work. Um, uh, you know, young storytellers, by the way, and we're going to have somebody on the panel. It's volunteer work, but it's a great way for you to get that experience of working in classrooms and 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 uh, working with curriculum uh, with kids um, at the end of the webinar. See the information about the after teaching. Uh, let me just see if there's any teaching. So, um, in terms of, uh, of of training, you know, getting people a little bit further ahead, 
what did you find yourself doing? You know, you, you were in the classrooms, you were in going into the prisons and doing the work that you do. But what did you find yourself doing to stay stay sharp on what's going on? Uh, did you workshops, conferences? You know, what what did you find helped you? Uh, putting yourself out there, uh, putting yourself in situations where you are not sure of that you can succeed but not being afraid to put yourself there. Mm -hmm. I, the, the most important learning processes for me was not knowing whether I was going to be able to handle this, but to put myself there anyway and learning from that experience, right. learning from it, uh, not being afraid to fail. I mean, I, I, I think that's the main thing. And that's the main thing about theater, isn't it? That right. we're not afraid, we're not afraid to fail. And that's what, Installing that and putting that thought process with a group of students that failure is part of the process. It's part of what we go through to discover and the discovery process is uh, most important. And that's, that's so important, the development of, of our, human, our human soul, our, our, our human, human development is uh, not being afraid to fail. I, I think that's so so wonderful, you know, just to throw that out because I think it's it is something when as for kids certainly, no matter you know whether it's kindergarten through twelve, you know, uh, uh, that's it. But as adults, even I mean, we're always dealing with that. And one of the definitions for creative, one of them is problem solving, right? Yes, and problem solving. Yes, we, we teach people to do. I'd like to show a video right now, if um, if uh, William can put it up, that we, um, we're going to show at the very beginning and then we'll move on to that. Uh, William, can you put that up? Did you know California's education code mandates all schools offer classes in dance, music, theater, and visual art? These classes are core curriculum with updated standards and frameworks, but only 12% of our schools have been meeting that mandate. Why is this important? Research shows the arts impact every measure on the accountability dashboard. Students with an arts education are five times more likely to stay in school, three times more likely to get a bachelor's degree, and four times more likely to be recognized for academic achievement. Students are not getting what they need and deserve. Those who are low income and of color face the greatest barriers to a full and relevant arts education. This is an equity issue. Of all core curriculum, the arts are unique in their ability to lower anxiety, engage your students, and achieve district goals in all other subjects, including English as a second language. Arts education matters outside the classroom too. In 2019, California's creative economy generated 2.7 million jobs. And creativity is the skill most sought after by employers. As we rebuild our state's economy, we need innovative students ready and able to fill the jobs of the future. Beyond academics and the economy, this moment requires that students' mental health and well-being be at the forefront of our decisions. Studies show arts education helps students heal from trauma and build resilience. The socio-emotional benefits are clear. It's not just nice to have. It's not optional. It's essential. If your district doesn't have an arts plan or needs help implementing one, Create California is here to help. Let's make every student a creative student. Yeah. Great. That's terrific. Yeah. Isn't that terrific? Yes, it, it is. I, mean, I wanted to play that. We were going to play that at the top, but um, we, we needed to get started. Uh, but I, I think what's important about that is just to really have an understanding that it isn't just about training kids to be artists. It's, it's, it's really helping them get into understanding how to deal with other parts of their curriculum and giving them that safe space. Um, we had a question around, because there are some people that are interested in working in prisons, you know, with prisons. Um, how would one get started in doing that kind of work? Well, there's uh, lots of organizations that are around right now that uh, they can contact. And if they want to email me, mm -hmm. um, I can 
give them my email address and I could get them in contact with uh, some folks. Or there's some, I'm, I'm sure there's other folks that are, that are online right now that know how to, and that are probably part of right. uh, the, the whole thing. The California Arts Council right. is uh, currently uh, working with uh, uh, the Department of uh, Corrections. Mm -hmm. And so they can get in touch with uh, the California Arts Council as well. And that would be another way of uh, getting started in, in working within prisons. And um, the Arts Council has been doing this for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's really, it, once again, that really gets into networking with various organizations and, and really getting yourself involved so that you really have a presence, you know, in, and, and you start to get to know people. And, yeah. uh, um, and I'm sure there's people on this call that, that are part of uh, Artists in Prison, like the Actors Gang. And right. I yeah, Actors Gang is great. You know, yeah. I know people that have worked same. with them and they've really loved working with them. Yeah. Um, and also when you're working with an arts education organization, they've got that structure, you know, that you can work within rather than having to try to figure it all out for yourself. Yes. Which, which is also very helpful. Well, right now it's very difficult right now because right. of the pain, you know, what's going on right now. Yeah, yeah. So, but they, but they're still getting arts education in there. Are are, are they are they? There's there's still we're we're yes, it's still happening, but it's happening happening on a very limited basis. Uh, it's nothing like artists actually going in and working, right? Uh, but uh, trying to keep that lifeline intact, right? Yeah, and I know I understand too. They can't have the camera on them. No. And, so uh, even if they may see the teaching artist uh, on uh, the Zoom platform, or whatever platform is being used, they, uh, you know, it's a one-way visual. Yeah, yeah, you couldn't have Zoom going inside. Yeah, yeah so it's a whole different experience. Yeah. Way. Well, I'm going to, you know, uh, I would like to just ask you, um, just from your point of view, um, if you wanted to give some encouraging uh, words which you have throughout this entire uh, talk, but when some some things that you would really want to leave with um, those people that are teaching artists that want to be teaching artists or just arts education in general, what would you want to leave them with? Um, the most important work ever: arts education. Uh, and it is most important now because our children, if you really think about what our kids are going through right now, they're really going to need us as artists even more when this is over. Just think about the process that they are having to go through right now. And so we're going to have to uh, liberate them <laughs> from all the stuff that is happening right now within their brains. I mean, I, I, and I think that arts and arts education is going to be the lifeline to creativity and the lifeline to getting us back to um, going forward. So everything that we can do to nurture ourselves and to keep ourselves going, all those techniques that we have learned about um, keeping ourselves open and keeping ourselves relaxed and keeping ourselves creative is going to come in handy. They're going to need us much more in the future uh, when this whole thing is over. So we're going to be in big need. So stay in there, keep motivated, keep motivating students that you see and people that you see and adults that you see and those folks who really think that the arts are not important, that is, I, I, I don't know where they come from. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just don't know. So I, I applaud all of you and all the artists out there and all those uh, educators who want to uh, make education um, full. Right. make education uh, what it is supposed to be uh, about life, about uh, everything around us, which includes all the arts. So I applaud you very much. 
Yeah, thank you. And um, I also want to say that something that um, I got from Mark Slavkin a few years ago when he was our keynote speaker uh, uh, over at the Wallace Annenberg, and one of the things he said is that being a teaching artist is an expansion of yourself as an artist. Very it's much. Not being a different person, it's just being able to be an artist in a different way. And um, how many communities really need this is yeah. amazing, you know. Yeah. So I and there's been a few things on the Q and A that just said to thank you for your service that you've done, Wayne, uh, all these years, and that you continue to do, and how you are really making a difference, you know, being here today, and also uh, in all the work that you've done. Uh, you know, so far. And I want to stay so in touch with you. You can't believe it because you've really inspired me today. And, um, and I'm sure that's the case with others who are here today. So thank you. And um, so I just want to, uh, we can do virtual applause, but I'm going to lead it with just saying thank you so much for um, giving us your time. And it's just going crazy right now on the chat room. You should go in there and just see all the wonderful people that are responding to you. Thank you for inviting me. I, I so enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. And um, so now we are going to be moving into our panel uh, of arts education organizations. And to do that, we are, um, we, we are very, very lucky to have Peter Kors, who uh, from the, uh, the Music Center, he's a uh, master teaching artist and he's going to be our moderator uh, but just in case you don't remember who Peter Kors is here's here's a look at him hi everybody my name is Peter Kors I'm a storyteller a musician and a teaching artist for the music center I got a question for you would you like to be in my story today? I thought so. Okay, you can. And I'll tell you exactly how we're going to do it, okay? And I have another question for you, too. Why is it that everybody loves a good story? What do you think? Well, I see some good thinking going on out there. Yes, I do. Yes, I... Well, I can tell you why I think stories are fun because they are a fun way to learn a lesson that's right and the story today is going to teach us a lesson stories that teach us lessons are called fables can you say fables good 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 okay now the fable that i'm going to tell you today is called the sun and the wind oh yeah and there's going to be some vocabulary words in there so keep your eyes open and your ears too all right here we go with the sun and the wind. We're just trying to see if we have everyone. We have Colette, we have Sheila, Gary, Vera, um, Peter, you're here. Bunny. Here, yeah, hi. I think you are all here. I just wanted to make sure that you were all here, and so I'm going to um, I'm going to go away from you for a little bit and um, uh, leave it over to the very capable hands of uh, Peter Kors, and um, let's have a good panel. Talk to you later. Bye. Thank you, Joanne, and uh, thank you, Wayne, for that very inspiring talk. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Peter, and um, I would like to introduce our panelists today. Uh, they are Bunny Hull, who is the founder of uh, founder and the executive director of Dream World Education. Colette Williams Alain. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, she is the chief education officer of the Inner City Arts. Uh, Gary Shields, who is the Director of Community Affairs and Partnerships, Education Through Music, wonderful organization. Um, we have Le Leviera Lim, 
who is a training and curriculum specialist with Young Storyteller. And we have Sheila Scott Wilkinson, who is the um, executive director of the Theater of Hearts, also the founder of the Theater of Hearts. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'd like to start off by um, asking you um, what, uh, what, um, what is the spe what is the specialty that you practice in your arts organization? Um, shall we start with? Um, well, just it's for grabs. So somebody start. Go ahead. Bunny, you're muted. Yeah, I, I there. Thank you, Bunny. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, sure. Our organization is Dream World Education. We provide a social emotional arts based education for children uh, in lower elementary grades. And we've been doing that since 2008 here in the Los Angeles area and underserved schools. Thank you. Um, Liviera, you're right there next to me on the screen. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization, what your function is inside of it. This is the Young Storytellers, uh, uh, right? Yes. So Young Storytellers uh, teaches social emotional learning um, through creative writing, primarily in elementary schools through screenwriting, but also in middle schools through monologue writing and in high schools through PSA writing. Okay, oh, thank you. Uh, Gary, um, I think you're muted, Gary. Um, if you turn on your microphone and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I am Gary Shields, the Director of Community Affairs and Partnerships for Education Through Music Los Angeles. And what we do is we help restore comprehensive music education in underserved communities throughout Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, we are in the year 2020. It's our 15th year. We are in almost 50 schools across six districts in the county. Um, we also work with the Archdiocese of Los Angeles and three charter school networks. Again, our main focus is restoring music as a core subject uh, during the, the school day for the kids in Los Angeles County who really need it the most. Thank you, Gary. Hi, Sheila. Hi. <laughs> you want to go so, up? Yeah, tell yeah. Us. <laughs> so uh, Theater of Hearts in our Youth First Artisan Resident Program we provide multidisciplinary visual and performing arts, that is theater, dance, music, uh, storytelling, uh, the whole, everything that you can imagine, but we custom design each program to suit the needs of the youngsters in the site that we serve. Uh, we've been in, in existence since 1987, but our Youth First Artisan Resident Program started in 1992 after the civil unrest. And we work in all of the various communities and sites, such as the juvenile hall and probation camps, the underserved schools, uh, libraries, uh, community centers, wherever their need is and that they would not receive a quality youth arts education, we are there. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, Colette, uh, first thing I have to ask you, Colette, is your last name is pronounced Elaine or Aline? What is it? Aline. Aline. Okay. <laughs> Neither yeah. one of the two. Okay. You were close. Uh, you were close. What? You were close. Oh, I was close. Yeah. <laughs> I got the first letter right. Okay. Uh, tell us a little bit about um, your organization and um, what you do in it. Um, my organization, I'm Colette Aline from Inner City Arts. We are an arts and education nonprofit organization based in downtown LA and uh, near Skid Row. And we provide visual media and performing arts instruction for students um, in grades K through 12, along with professional development and adult education um, for teachers, parents, educators, and community partners. Um, and those art forms that we cover range from performing arts, dance and theater, to visual arts, which includes uh, animation, graphic design, uh, ceramics. And um, we also have a college and career focus program. So our work of art program focuses on preparing students for college and career readiness. So we kind of cover the spectrum. Our focus is the community and it includes social emotional learning, uh, 21st century skills and uh, art skills. So working to develop the whole self in the process. Thank you. All very exciting. Welcome all. Uh, question number one. 
Would you uh, share with us what your, and I know some of you have answered this a little bit already, but um, your arts organization, how did you manage uh, to transition from being in the classroom to uh, distance learning? Um, I, I could start if you'd like. Yeah. Uh, yes, please, Sheila. Go ahead. Sheila, yeah. Uh, you know, everything came down very quickly, as you know, the shutdown. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, everything had to sh shut down, but some of our sites, we could pivot right away. And uh, we were able to do dance, storytelling, and also creative writing in the, some of the parks. And, uh, but it is really uh, very challenging um, because uh, the artists, uh, there were different platforms that we had to work with. Uh, and I'll speak about that later. But the kids were very uh, interested in terms of the artists being able to pivot that fast and that they were excited. Mm -hmm. Although when we're doing that, you know, the teachers are not with them. They are in their home settings. So you have to really manage that. And so the artists had to really learn how to deal with that. For instance, dance, they had to learn with uh, doing one step at a time, choreographing one step at a time, then bringing all of the uh, kids together. But, um, and, and then in the halls and the camps, that is a whole nother thing, which I'll talk about uh, later. Okay, okay, good, thank you, Sheila. Now, Gary, I noticed on your website for the uh, education, education Through Music organization that you already have a very strong presence. Did you begin this like in March or had you been doing this all along? Yeah, that is actually, uh, I'm assuming you're referring to uh, the resources and the links and the videos that we have. Uh, right, right, dedicated. right. Yeah. Yes. So some of that was begun um, before uh, March, but obviously um, post-March that, that, that need to create more content to be shared out uh, became more important and uh, not only you know it, it, the arts ed ecosystem is 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 special I mean I think we're all in this together like I think Joanne mentioned that uh, in the previous segment um, so it was about us reaching out to other content creators um, and sharing their resources um, on our site as well as on the flip side getting requests from other organizations Grammy Museum uh, for instance, asking if they can use some of our content on their site. So I think the arts ed, ed ecosystem that we are all in is about that teamwork. Um, so yes, to answer your question, Peter, um, a lot of those resources were there, um, but uh, we set mandates um, once March came around for all of our educators to really uh, dig in deeper, both in terms of their creation of um, asynchronous material that can be for their, their uh, students and their classes, their schools more broadly. We encouraged each of our teaching uh, teachers to create uh, their own YouTube account so that they can host their material there as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you know, certainly March was about um, using the content already in existence, but really digging in deeper. I mean, overnight, we had almost 30 teachers, six supervisors creating new content to share out. So um, yeah, that was a, a huge task, <laughs> for sure. I can imagine. Did you find the other organizations, and uh, you mentioned the Grammy organization, did you find them cooperative, willing to work with you? Um, yeah, exactly. On both good. sides, again, when it came to us sharing out our materials, but also us reaching out to, for instance, music publishers, Alfred Music Publishing, for instance, mm -hmm. um, we found... Uh, on both sides a uh, very receptive and a willingness to again realize this, the gravity of the moment that we're all in right. and really at the end of the day what we're trying to do is impact students lives and the best right. way to do that is to share content and is to work together so uh, we found great success uh, doing that good, good. thank you gary oliviera um i think your mic is off yeah yes. <laughs> uh so what we did was we typically have a toolkit that we give to all of our teaching artists to help them facilitate the curriculum in the classroom. And we, over the course of the spring, redid all of those things to make sure that they worked in a digital 
platform. So we redid all of our workbooks so that the students could fill them out online through fillable PDFs or potentially print them out. We gave all of our teaching artists slideshows. We reinvented the games so that they could be played online. Mm -hmm. All of our sort of movement oriented games became a little bit more contained. Um, we encouraged our teaching artists to think of creative ways to bond the classroom so that the students felt connected, whether that meant um, sharing things in their household that they wanted or creating a space that was similar in some way, whether a similar color background or having like a specific prop to sort of create that sense of community. And we just had to reimagine all of the tools that we were giving them for the um, in-person space and how do we transfer that into the online space. So there was a lot of coordinated effort around that, talking to the schools, making sure the students had tablets or um, Chromebooks, as well as uh, partnering with different organizations such as Warner Brothers, um, where we with them were able to craft sort of a curriculum that we could hand to the teachers in English language arts classrooms so that they could take their students and they could add it onto their existing curriculum. But we gave them tools using the DC intellectual property and DC heroes to help the students process the feelings that they were feeling through this and how they as a superhero might react in these times which is very cool. Yeah. yeah, you have to go from this big, huge space to this tiny little space, which is very challenging, yeah. Uh, Bunny, you're next. Um, oh, right, thank you. Um, yeah. Well, we, we were quick, quickly pivoting um, like everyone else was, and when March 16th came and all schools closed, we knew we had to do something because uh, we were no longer able to be in any of the schools that we were currently in. We were in 10 schools in the Los Angeles area so um, we, we moved to developing a virtual residency, which replicated what we were doing in schools. Uh, we um, hired, I hired a film crew. We approached it as if we were developing a television series, something that we could then expand upon as we needed to by, with the ability to send artists into schools when we could. So uh, it, our program is called Secrets of the Heart. It's, this is a program that starts in kindergarten for children. And so I brought a little clip. Um, it's actually a whole episode, which is 15 minutes long, as we had to, as everyone else is, I'm sure has found, you have to edit the time that you can work with students online because you're not able to work with them in a full 45 minutes as we were used to being in classroom. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'd like to show, I, I think they have, William has queued it up. Uh, I guess, William, you can stop it after about three minutes. We won't probably get to the uh, instruction portion, but you'll kind of see how it's going and how we've embodied what, what we do. This is how you say hello in Brooklyn, New York. Yeah, we're so happy to be here with you today. My name is Mr. B. And I'm Benny. And this is Secrets of the Heart. Secrets, secrets, secrets of the heart. Secrets, secrets, secrets of the heart. I've got love and I've got joy. Oh, I've got joy. Peace and I've got happiness. Oh, I got joy. Got to let my secrets out. Got to share them with the world. Got to whisper, got to shout. Oh, I got joy. Secrets, Tell the secrets, secrets, feel the energy. Secrets of the heart. Secrets, feel the heartbeat, secrets, sing the melody. Secrets of the heart. Little acts of kindness, little acts of kindness, little acts of kindness every day. Nice job, thank you. Little acts of kindness, little acts of kindness, gotta show little acts of kindness along the way. Everybody sing, little acts of kindness, 
Little acts of kindness, yo! Little acts of kindness every day. Let your sunshine in. Little acts of kindness. Little acts of kindness. Gotta show little acts of kindness along the way. So, so when I say a go, that means, are you ready to listen? And when I say a may, that means, yes, I'm ready. Let's try it. A go. A may. A go. A may. I see you. You are somebody. Now, you really did edit this like a movie, didn't you? We yeah. did. We, we hired an editor. I mean, we hired a film crew. We hired everything we needed. Um, so what you didn't see, and by the way, that's Bruce Lenoyle, and he is a graduate of the Actors Fund Teaching Artist Program, and yeah. we were really blessed to have them join us. Mm -hmm. um, so what we've done is, what you didn't see is we'll continue on, and the children will learn how to make puppets, their own puppet out of paper, a piece of paper, and each of our uh, segments uh, attaches a, an art form, an arts discipline, multi-arts discipline to what we call a secret of the heart, where they learn in this episode it was individuality, so they learn that there's nobody like they are. Um, so this is what, we have 24 episodes that we've developed at this point. Um, we've switched uh, you know, we know that we have to be able to sustain ourselves, right? We were at the beginning, we, we had created 10 episodes that we were, uh, had given to public access television here in LA, as well as we're delivering to the, our partner schools. Uh, but now we know we can't continue to give things away for free and support ourselves. So we're, we're developing this as a subscription program, as well as continuing to support the inner city schools that can't afford this program um, with the help that they need. And um, so we'll be, uh, this, we're launching a new site with the subscription program. We'll be uh, allowing people to purchase it for grade levels, for teachers to share during remote learning, also uh, for individual classroom use, Montessori schools. Um, I mean, it can be used in children's hospitals, it can be used in shelters, uh, and also for homeschoolers. So we're really, we're hiring a new staff. We've unfortunately uh, had to let go of some people who were working with us in schools, but to be able to, not, not our artists, but, but some of our program support staff because there was just no work for them in this time. That, that was the really sad part and the sad reality about this. Really, but we, yeah. uh, we're now hiring some new people to help to, um, bring this to where it needs to be, uh, to keep us going and to be able to continue to support our artists by creating new content. Great, great, wonderful, thank you. Now I know there's a lot of teaching artists uh, uh, watching out there and uh, here's a question that I'm sure that all of them would like some sort of answer to. Um, what are the strengths you look for in, in a teaching artist's ability to teach virtual online? Who wants to take that one? Colette, you look ready. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, I mean, I, I think it won, runs really deep. What we what we would look for. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think trusting your instincts as a teaching artist mm -hmm. that you have in the classroom space. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, and knowing that those skills are transferable. Mm -hmm. One thing we learned is that it's very important for our teaching artists to feel comfortable seeking professional development opportunities mm -hmm. to grow their technology skills. Do I would say- these, uh, to the, Excuse me, do you provide <laughs> PD um, uh, training for your teaching artists? Yes. Okay. Yes, one of the things that we did at the beginning of this process was we hosted a Zoom uh, staff development where we actually went through the process of uh, logging on to Zoom, how to use Zoom and maximize the experience for students. We brought in one of our partners um, who teaches digitally through UC Irvine. He did a session for us on Google Classroom because we didn't use an LMS before. Our organization has really been based about the place um, because our campus is one acre. We have eight studios that are designed to create that safe space for students. And what we learned when we transitioned to the visual, uh, to the online platform is that one, we had what we needed as far as the artistic skills and the educational pieces were concerned, uh, but we knew that we had to support not only our teaching artists, but our students in this transition. We had to we had to make sure that they had their devices um, that our staff had the equipment that they needed to transition so we provided cameras for teachers at their homes we provided laptops for them we had to update some of our software we provided staff development um, but i would say really it's very important for the teaching artists to trust themselves and know that they're not in this by themselves the students or the resource as well, because this is a generation of youth that have grown up with technology since birth. So students were more technology friendly. Um, one thing that we did know, we had assistants. So our teaching artists had studio assistants that helped manage the classroom space. We supported them with the breakout sessions um, and just taking role because that was a big part of what we did when we transitioned. Um, I have a little clip to share. I'm not sure if I'll be if I can share it, but it is actually a clip of one of the students who participated in our summer program. And, and the student was very shy. His his father said, you know, he didn't communicate much about his creativity. And by the time he finished our program, he was sharing his animation process and telling the story of what he did to create his work. So I don't know if I can share that, or is it possible to share that now? Uh, Clifford? Let's see. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, okay. Yeah, we can. And Peter, you may also have this in your inbox. Um, My chat if, yeah, if it takes too long to load, I will come off of it. But it's a three minute clip of a student just really explaining um, his process and the pure joy that he shared with us in what it took to create the work. Um, mm -hmm. I will stop the share. What it took to create the work and how it made him feel after he completed it was absolutely uh, wonderful. Yeah, magic. Say, yeah. Another piece for the teaching artist is being okay with collaborating with your colleagues. We have right. media yes. art teachers who had technology experience, so seeking their support right. and taking the time to tinker with all of the platforms because as I also heard, many of the schools we were able to continue serving didn't all use Zoom. Some of them use Google Hangouts. So right. we had to be able to pivot and respond to our partners as they shared with us um, what platforms and needs that they had in the classroom because right. we were able to continue our classroom experience as well as the self-select program for students who would just log in at home on their own. Um, and for the first time we did, K through six self-select. We have not done that in the past. So it was very interesting to see how our younger students connected with the experience as um, working by themselves and not with their classroom teachers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Gary, um, what do you look for in a teaching artist to be working um, remotely? 
other than having perfect pitch? <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, it's, that's an interesting question. You know, um, many of our expectations of our teachers um, haven't really changed, you know, from what, what, is, what are the expectations in a live setting. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, you know, um, a lot of what Colette just touched on remains true for, for education through Music Los Angeles. So the, those additional things that we are engaging our teachers on um, are becoming proficient in online platforms, plural, because as Colette just mentioned, you know, across districts, there's no uniformity in terms of what platform Zoom versus right. Right. Central versus all of those. Um, so we, uh, we uh, similarly do have 10 days of uh, professional development d- uh, provided to our teachers throughout the year. And obviously we, our biggest, uh, training dates are coming up at the end of this month, right as we get into the school year. So a lot of our training will be around um, changes to online platforms, uh, mm-hmm. best practices. We want our teachers to, um, to, to set up classroom etiquette so that they can maintain um, student behavior and optimal learning uh, environments. You know, that's, I think, I'm sure everyone on this panel has heard stories and everyone uh, watching the, the panel um, have had stories about those first couple of weeks or couple of months of that, that adjustment. Um, students weren't used to being you know, in school at home. And so there was a lot of adjustment um, in all quarters for everyone to sort of get used to that. So um, you know, we want our teachers to uh, prepare engaging, differentiated, age appropriate um, music lessons. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, uh, you know, you'll hear from one of our supervisors in a session later. Um, she's one of our early childhood ed- uh, music education experts. Um, so there's going to be additional training for our teachers in terms of it's not just good enough to be the great teacher that you were in a live setting. There are differences. There are new uh, approaches and techniques that you need to lean on in this distance uh, space. So hopefully in, our, in the later session later this afternoon, you'll hear a, a little bit more specifics. Um, but again, our training, five-day training coming up at the end of this month is going to be that opportunity for us to really touch on all of the, um, the expectations, the new expectations, if you will, going into this new school year. Because I think a lot of us would admit um, there was a, a lot of grace given to lots of people, lots of industries, uh, really in March, trying to just flip overnight to a new mode. Um, so there was a lot of grace given to teachers, teaching artists, yeah. families, quite frankly, uh, students, quite frankly. And so um, going into this next school year, you know, that grace is going to be a, a little bit less because now that expectation is everyone is online. Yeah, the quality of our product has to then rise to the occasion. So that's what we have our sights set on uh, for this upcoming school year. So um, hopefully that speaks to a little bit about what we expect our music teachers, our teaching artists um, to really have in their toolkit going into the new school year. Thank you, Gary. Good. Livieri, uh, you want to share? Yes, um, I really resonated with a lot of the things that you said, Gary. Um, it was difficult. It was a tough transition. Um, and other than just the technical difficulties and having to learn a new platform, I think one of the really great strengths that we saw in some of our teaching artists was the ability to start delegating and sharing responsibility. Um, I think so the way our model works is our we have sort of the lead uh, teaching artist who leads a group of volunteer mentors and then those mentors each are assigned to a specific student and help them through the story writing process. And what we saw was the really successful head mentor teaching artists were the ones who were able to take the information, look at the curriculum, look at what needed to be done and not be the only one who is solely responsible for everything. They were able to identify resources to help them, whether there were other mentors who could handle the tech piece or could handle certain activities or could keep the students occupied while the teaching artist is working with the teacher to make sure that all the students are online, troubleshooting all of those things. Um, and that flexibility, that ability to sort of understand what they're responsible for and what they can kind of let go of was a huge strength in our classrooms. Um, and coming this fall, uh, we usually host these long sort of four hour trainings um, every semester uh, for our teaching artists. And 
we just found out that's not sustainable online. It's really hard sometimes to go for that long online and be constantly learning and soaking up new information. So we'll be breaking up those trainings, making them very specialized, things about uh, trainings on curriculum, trainings on the tech piece, specifically on Zoom, how to lead a session in classroom management, and also how to lead a webinar on Zoom when we bring all of our students' words to life, when we bring in those professional actors to act out the stories that they've created, how do we manage that on a different platform because it's very different than managing a classroom and the staff is currently going through a series of um, anti-racism and bias training PDs and we will be working with professionals to develop that for our teaching artists and for our greater community because that's really important to us um, and we want to be able to think about those things, things like access, things about privilege um, and how that seeps into the education. So I'm really excited that we'll be offering these things this upcoming yeah, school year. Uh, let's see, uh, Bunny, have you had your... Uh... <laughs> Uh, I think your mic is off. I, I echo so many things that everyone else has said so eloquently. Um, I mean, for us, it, we're just beginning our training, uh, assembling our training sessions for artists to be able to go into schools to augment our program. Um, we're teaching them, you know, how to communicate we'll be teaching them how to communicate in a new way. Uh, something that Peter, I noticed you're so, you do so well in your little performance piece in the beginning. I mean, how you have to look into the eyes of, of the children that are, that are out there uh, to make them feel and that you're connecting with them. And it's really an art. It's, it's sort of developing a new era of Mr. Rogers, you know, um, where you're, you're able to connect with, with your audience so well. So, uh, I mean, I, I don't have really too much to add to what everyone has said so well. Um, it's, really, it's really developing a whole new roadmap for what we do from a distance. Right, yeah. Sheila, I don't think you've had a turn yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, um, I diddle everyone. Um, I think that, you know, because we do custom design each program to suit the needs of wherever we go. And, um, in the halls and the camps, the juvenile halls and the camps, it is really important that the artists have patience, flexibility. All of our artists are great at what they do, but they really have to be able to dialogue with those kids right now. Uh, you know, it, we can't just think of arts for art's sake right now at all. It is that uh, the process of really understanding the kids that you're talking to, the kids that we have been involved with, they have been shut-ins. You know, they have been watching the news in their uh, units, but you know, they're very frustrated and they're very antsy and they really wanna talk. And the, in the inequalities that the kids that are locked into these facilities, it's, we look for artists who are not missionaries, but artists that really see their full potential in the growth and, and the artists that have so many tools in their back pocket. So when one thing doesn't work, they bring something else out. Yeah. If that doesn't work, you know, they have to be that flexible and that engaging. And also with remote learning, you really have to have energy. You know, the kids will, the focus, you've got to bring them into focus almost immediately and catch them, know all of their names. Mm -hmm. So I'm, we do guerrilla training with all of our artists and that is ongoing because they're going to so many various sites and working with so many different uh, 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 neighborhoods and in schools and community centers and so forth and so on. But it really is important, A, also, that they are willing to do their homework. Mm -hmm. We're really asking our artists to delve in to really look at the Latino and African-American heroes that can relate it back to their curriculum, whether it is uh, social studies, whether it is uh, mathematics, it doesn't matter, so that they are ready to so that the kids can have self-identification in terms of that connection to a hero and to someone that looks like them. 
And it doesn't matter if the artist, what color or ethnicity the artist is, but they really have to understand who, what, and where they're going. And it's not business as usual right now because the inequalities that's happening, I think it's a glaring mirror to our educational system. And I think all of you guys know that working in the underserved areas that we have been working in for many years, mm -hmm. that you really have to rethink. And especially I think with the, uh, with the distant learning, it is really important that even the younger kids to really dialogue about uh, some of these issues and the teachers that we're working with really want us to do so. And we do it anyway, but this is really more important than ever to uh, connect those, um, the, 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 what's happening today into the curriculum and what, what we're, we're teaching. Right, to make it significant. And yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's amazing. I'm learning so much, you guys. Thank you. <laughs> um, but uh, with all your different answers, what res you know, there's it's just some things that resonate throughout, you know, the values. And my next question then would be, what are some of the, if you would expand on some of the values that being able to bring arts education into the classroom virtually, what values does that bring to the table? Who wants to um, begin that one? Colette, you're on. <laughs> I'll go with that one. Um, I feel like the value of the online learning, one of the things is it, it releases the barriers of mm -hmm. physical location. It reduces the peer pressure that I believe students experience in classrooms. Um, mm -hmm. And even in the creative space, sometimes there's this need for perfection or the desire to make something that looks better than someone else's. And one of the things we believe helps students with the, in the online platform is they are able to tap into their creativity without disruption. Um, mm -hmm. Even though maybe the home environment is not ideal, things maybe weren't quiet, but their work is their work. Mm -hmm. And they don't have an adult trying to fix what they're producing or manipulate them to move into a certain way or form. Their creativity is theirs um, and they look at it as an opportunity. Um, it so it, it, it kind of enhances their own self-expression is what you're saying, rather than it being a competitive thing, which, it, which can happen in the classroom, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And it allows a certain sense of freedom. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. I, we have had stu we had students during the session that felt like they had more ownership of their learning experience mm -hmm. because the pressure was removed and they had time to pace themselves. Mm -hmm. we, we reduced the times of our sessions, but made sure that they had something to leave with. Their mm -hmm. takeaway was continuing the work. Um, and how long then, were your sessions while, while we're talking about that, if I could interrupt, go ahead. Say that one more time. Uh, how long were you, you said you reduced them from what to what? They were, um, our classes ranged anywhere from an hour and 15 minutes to two hours, depending mm. on the art form and the age of the students. But right. we learned very quickly that about 45 minutes was what we needed. Um, yeah. It did yeah. get a little bit challenging when, you, when we came across technology challenges, especially mm -hmm. in the performing arts. Right. Um, so we're making those adjustments now. But it, it really was for the students, the benefit of it was the independence, um, the freedom to create, and the ability to still connect with their peers, although it was online, providing space for them to work in teams, mm -hmm. um, and ensuring that our teaching artist had the tools in their toolkit to engage students in an online space. Right. It, that was a major part of it is maintaining student engagement for those that would not want to freely express themselves. How do you bring them into it in a very safe way? Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Colette. Anybody else want to add? Uh, yes, Bunny, please. I'd like to add to that. One of the things that I think this is uh, the value that this is bringing is to their academic education. Because uh, with, their, with children learning at home and, and having, I ha have seen how that's working in some of our inner city schools with Zoom trainings from classroom teachers, you know, where kids are sitting on couches, some in their cars trying to get an inter internet signal from somewhere. The arts, the arts is a way to focus that child's attention because 
there's such joy that comes with the arts experience that I believe that what we're doing is bringing a focal point to that learning mm -hmm. so that, that now when they do have an academic session, that, that they are more focused, that they understand that they can center their attention where it needs to be. And I think that the arts is a really important part of that right now. And, you know, of course, classroom teachers are so concerned with academic learning, you know, for our five-year-olds that we're teaching, you know, these children need to learn how to read and need to know how to work with numbers. And um, it's, it's, it's been a really interesting experience working with these classroom teachers through this you know, they're ha they've been having a very rough time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know a lot of you may work in other settings other than public schools, but in the public school settings, it's, it's really, um, it's challenging. Uh, teachers are having a challenging time being able to connect parents and connect with, with uh, you know, the resources that the children need at home. And even just being able to get online is a huge, yeah. huge problem. So um, I think what we're doing is, is, is life changing for these children. I really do, uh, to be able to, to uh, bring them the inspiration that they need to carry on with this life that we're in right now. Excellent, thank you. Uh, uh, Gary. Um, About the va uh, values? Yeah, the values. Uh, um, uh, and especially if you could touch on how you do music online, because I know that when you do Zoom, there's this delay, right? So you can't really play together. It's all asynchronous, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'll, I'll touch on our uh, values first. Um, yeah, sure. Education Through Music Los Angeles actually have four values. Um, teamwork, excellence, discovery, and service. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of those values in the con context of how we work with and encourage our music teachers to connect um, and impact students. So teamwork, I would say um, we have uh, one evidence of that is <clears throat> us leveraging all of the expertise within our staff. As I mentioned uh, later on, you'll hear from Allison Tuthill, who is one of our instructional supervisors with specialty in uh, early childhood mu music education. But we also mm -hmm. have experts on our staff uh, in music production and technology. We have uh, choral experts. We have um, instrumental ensemble experts. So teamwork, huge. Excellence. Um, um, Kodai, who was a, um, he's a namesake of a, a music methodology that many music teachers use, mm -hmm. once said, let us take our children seriously. Everything else follows from this. Only the best is good enough for a child. Um, so we want to make sure that as artists, as teachers, that we are uh, not just, um, it's not just playtime, right? That kids can learn to play, uh, but that the art forms are rigorous, um, that they are assessed, that they are tested, um, and that they are receiving top-notch uh, education. Um, discovery, just that willingness to be open to learning both new technical co uh, content, but also curriculum uh, specific areas. And I think um, Colette uh, talked a little bit about um, that earlier. And one thing that, that we have been keen on is because of uh, the pandemic and because of quarantine, and we're forced to do lots of things online, we're now assessing once this is all over, are there things that we've introduced now that we can continue to provide in an online um, format? Because I think as Colette, the point she was making was that that barrier is now torn down. And so we can access students in Compton at the same time as students in Burbank. We can bring them together in some sessions, whereas before, really our education was site specific for the most part. Uh, and the last value is service. Um, and so th that's the most important word um, that we are serving students and by extension, we are serving those families and those communities and improving outcomes, um, uh, educational out outcomes for those students. Um, and so the second question, Peter, you were yeah, because there might be teach music teaching artists out there who are facing this, uh, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, again, Allison is going to go over. I think um, all of our teachers have been encouraged to um, introduce movement and dance or some form of movement in their instruction, both um, to break up, you know, just to break up yeah, yeah. the session. Yeah. Um, that's going to be heavily critical, but also thinking of creative ways. I think another panelist mentioned, you know, sharing objects that might be in the child's home, giving the kid 
30 seconds to go run and get items, um, sharing out uh, those sorts of things. Um, and, and, and to speak to your question about the delay, that's been one of the hugest uh, yeah. initial challenges is music is all about the synchronicity right. of being together. Um, so one of the things that we've, we've uh, found in, a, in one of the apps that we use is uh, there, are, there are settings um, where you can share your um, different audio from your computer versus audio that might appear in, in, a, um, in a song or a video. So we are, that's gonna be some of our training devoted to uh, those different settings and how do you mute and how do you isolate or select uh, kids? Uh, because yes, that is the challenge. Uh, five kids performing or trying to perform the same thing at the same time, yeah. not gonna work so well. So giving uh, one kid at, the op, uh, at a time, that sort of, those strategies are what we're currently uh, working through and we'll be working with our teachers to come up with the best strategies and best practices to handle music in an online format. But again, we found some success, great success actually with instrumental um, in doing just that. Um, but we're finding that it's more smaller groups of kids mm -hmm. as opposed to these larger ensembles uh, in an online formatting. Right. Thanks, Gary. Riviera, values. What, uh, what's, what's, what's the new, what, what's some of the new stuff you guys are bringing in? Um, I think there's been sort of just the context of what uh, our programs are doing to serve our students is different. Whereas before we had students, um, and this was an opportunity, a program to make them feel special, especially since they were selected by the teachers to complete their story. Um, it was a very unique experience and we spent a lot of effort making sure that they felt that they were recognized and seen and heard and not that we don't do those things anymore but now um, in the virtual classroom since they're so far away from the rest of their peers this has actually become more of an opportunity for them to connect to play together to feel a sense of belonging and a sense of community um, and to collaborate with each other in a way that they might not have been able to before um, because they're doing these activities together and they are together and bonding over the shared experience. So even though it's a similar experience of storytelling, the context of it and the purpose of it has kind of shifted with the circumstances. And mm -hmm. that's been really cool to see. Yeah, good, good. Uh, let's see, who ha Bunny, have you uh, been up yet for this uh, I values did. question? Values. I, I yeah. did, but I can add to what I said actually, because I, I do think that the ability to reach uh, as Gary touched on, outside of site specific. I mean, with we, we're looking into national, being able to reach in a national way into the homeschool market with with what we're doing. And I think it it's it's really uh, there's a gift in what's happening right now with the ability to do that. I mean, our teaching artists. We we were looking to develop a training uh, outside of LA where we would travel to go and do that. And now now we don't need to do that. We can do it right from where we are. And so everything that we've been preparing is enabling us to do that in a greater way. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, anybody else? Um, Sheila, did you have a turn yet? Um, uh, no, but it, it, I think that our, what we have to say, I think I'll just say this is it. Um, mm -hmm. Theater Hearts, we believe that arts education is a fundamental right and not a, a, a privilege. Um, we are committed to working with communities that are ethnically and culturally diverse, densely populated, and economically challenged. And every Youth First program is a model of inclusion, crossing lines of racial and cultural differences, and provides youth with the opportunities and long-term mentoring that is crucial to making a lasting impact. Yeah. And that's pretty much what Theater of Hearts is all about. But I did want to add, because yeah. we are doing the work in the halls and the camps. Yeah. And that's a, that's a specialized uh, uh, protocol that we have to follow. And the artists that work in the halls and the camps right now with the distant learning that we're doing. Um, we're working with the Los Angeles County Office of Education and Probation, and we had to learn Microsoft Team. And mm -hmm. so all the artists had to learn that and translate all of their curriculum to 
an hour. We were mostly working with them an hour and a half or two hours. Mm -hmm. Also, it was very important that, an, that we connect with the teachers because the teachers are no longer in the room. Right. Only the probation officers are there and they don't have the same connection with the arts. So our teachers, our mentors, we call our artists, artist mentors, mm -hmm. that they really have to connect with the teaching staff, which is remote, the probation officers, which is remote, and the, facilitate, the facilitator in us. And they have to be invited into the classroom. Mm -hmm. And this is sometimes very difficult that we are invited into the classroom because of the timing, because the kids may not be moved into that position. So that's what I wanted to say. There's more to it than that, but it is a whole nother beast working in the halls and the camps. Yeah, yeah, as is everything else these days, I guess. Right? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. One, I think we have about uh, um, seven minutes left in there. Here's one question that I'm sure that um, uh, people would like to hear your particular take on. Is there anything specific you would like to share to those who already are or want to become teaching artists in this particular climate of Zooming and Google, Google chat or Google group or Google classroom? Go ahead, whoever wants to. Uh, any uh, particular? I yeah, yeah, funny. Yeah. Uh, I would just say, don't underestimate your power to make a difference mm -hmm. in somebody's life. Mm -hmm. uh, because every single, I, I mean, I've found the resilience of our teaching artists has just been amazing. Mm -hmm. They've been, the ability to create is such a gift and it, it is a powerful impact on children. And so don't underestimate what you have to give and just it, it's just you know you just have to learn some technology and 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 you can do you can give your gift from wherever you are so i would just say you know don't don't forget the power that you have okay thank you thank you bunny uh, can i just can yeah, i just add something to also mm -hmm. is that remember that the kids are always listening no matter what they hear you and i think a lot of our artists they think oh you know especially with the chat you know we're not being able to see them and everything and then all of a sudden everything lights up they have questions and uh, we found that also when we're working uh on a one-to-one -one with them you know the kids that weren't even listening that we thought the, the artists thought they weren't listening and all of a sudden they turn up with a 25 page script <laughs> I mean, this is what's happening all the time. So we always say, uh, just what Bunny said, don't underestimate yourself and always know that the youngsters are listening, even though you think they may not. Yeah, yeah. Colette, um, something you want to share, a specific thing that um, occurs to you? Or I'll give you a minute. You know, I'm, big on, I, I'm big on instincts. Um, uh -huh. and, and I would say, find resources and if you don't know where to go for the resources um, put yourself in a position where you can reach out to people who may have resources mm -hmm. it is it is definitely a very different space to live in it requires a lot more thought it requires a lot more planning um, it requires a lot more reflection and that's okay um, just look at it as a learning experience. This is part of the growth. And I will give a specific example of one of my teaching artists who has been doing this for over 25 years. One of the reflections she shared with us is that I have learned so much about myself and my practice mm -hmm. and what is possible in mm -hmm. this transition to online learning. And I would not have known this about myself if not for this moment in time. So, I would say seek the information, work with your peers, work with colleagues, and just continue to investigate and learn because these are some of the same skills we, we teach or we aspire to teach to our students. Um, this is a moment of resilience 
And, mm -hmm. and I have seen that in almost all of the artists, even outside of my organization, for how they have transitioned to online learning. They, it's a hustle. Um, <laughs> the independent <laughs> contractors have turned this into an amazing opportunity. And I think Gary said it, um, we know now what's capable. So what we're looking at and what our teaching artists are thinking is not how do we continue this online learning for now, it's how do we continue to grow and develop for this online learning to stay a part of our process even after COVID is over mm -hmm. because this has expanded our boundaries. We are now able to reach people outside of our communities. And I think for the heart of this work and how we all feel about arts education, our goal is to impact communities. Inner city arts is about transforming lives through the arts. And this is definitely deepening that experience. And it's also transforming the lives of our teaching artists in the process because they now know that they have a further reach, they have increased their skills, and um, their impact is different. It's online. It's online. Vivier, something specific you want to share? I would say be forgiving of yourself. <laughs> um, things are not going to go perfect. This is an unprecedented time. We're all learning things together and- We're all amateurs, right? Made. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, if something happens, if there's a mistake or if nothing, if something is not perfect, then just learn from it, keep failing forward, but don't beat yourself up about it. Like really be forgiving of yourself because your best is good enough. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let's see who hasn't had a chance to Gary, did you, did you have something specific you want to share? Sure. Yeah. I would just encourage teach, teachers, teaching artists, artists who want to work with kids, be, um, helpful and as indispensable to the administrator as possible, whether we're talking about schools, uh, mm -hmm. prisons, make yourself um, as helpful. Um, you've got to, I've talked with the uh, 50 principals, multiple conversations this, this entire month. Um, they are under a lot of pressure. They have competing mm -hmm. priorities mm -hmm. as most administrators do at a crazy time like this. So if you as a teaching artist and, or a teacher can go to them with solutions around scheduling, solutions around integration, how do you integrate your art form with other core subjects? If you can go to, to your administrators with solutions, you, um, I think they, you will make that person's day. Um, that's what they're looking for yeah. uh, in times like these. And that's what one of the things that we do with at Education Through Music. We really work closely with the principal to, to really work towards a schedule that works for them. So I would just say, make yourself helpful and indispensable and also be prepared to sell your program again. Even if you have worked with a partner for years, um, you know, a lot of what's going on right now, um, there have been huge funding impacts in a lot of different areas. And so it's not that some uh, administrators don't want our programming anymore. It's that they are facing dire choices. Um, so I would just say, encourage you to be prepared to sell your services or your program again, in terms of speaking towards the benefit of what your art form can bring to students in a time like this. Good, good, thank you. Uh, anybody else? Want, we have like uh, zero time, but I'm happy to just, if somebody just, has. Uh, <laughs> just one thing, uh, yeah. everything uh, was absolutely correct, but I would, the artists that we're working with, it's really important that they are prepared, more yeah. so than even going into the classroom, that they have their, if they're showing clips, their resources, because they don't have that much time in the kids, you will lose them if you are not totally prepared. Mistakes happen, technology and all of that, but that is really, really important that they can transition smoothly and we find the most success and we help our artists with that. But that is really important that they have everything ready to go. Excellent, excellent. Uh, anybody else? We have like, you know, we're over, but um, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, can we have uh, like a, <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you for helping us navigate these unknown waters and I'm sure we'll be talking to each other again sometime. Joanne, I'm gonna turn this back over to you. Are you there? There you are. I have the very 
great honor of being able to moderate um, this incredible group of uh, teaching artists. Um, most of them I know uh, through our program, but uh, uh, there, there's, uh, we have someone who is with another program uh, with um, uh, education uh, through um, music, LA, uh, Allison uh, Tuthill. And, um, but, the, the, but the basic thing I want to talk about for us is how we can, how we're processing, you know, doing work this way. And I also want to say, because this is all new, everybody's on different levels of doing it. There's some th things that some people are starting to, they've, they've applied it and some people haven't been able to apply it yet, but they're working on it, you know, to move there through um, a different direction in the work that they're doing. And some are working with professional organizations, uh, arts education organizations to make this happen. So I'm going to uh, also mention that if you have any questions for the panelists, because we will be taking those, please put them in the Q&A and not the chat because uh, we'll be collecting those from the Q&A. So let's just get started. Um, I thought it would be a good idea just to go around uh, uh, to each of you just to say your name and uh, as, as a teaching artist and maybe what area you're working with as a teaching artist so people can get acquainted or if you are working with an organization, okay? So why don't we start with you? Uh, I need, I'm used to calling you B, but it says Bruce up there. So um, uh, Bruce, you want to just uh, say something? Many aliases. Hi. Hi, I'm, I'm Bruce Lenoil, B. Lenoil, and I'm Benny. Oh, he's got his mask on still. We did a PSA with, uh, with Bunny. Ah, that's better. So uh, I'm uh, a puppeteer. Uh, um, I'm a puppeteer, and uh, I did the video uh, Secrets of the Heart with, uh, with Bunny. And um, basically, um, challenge of teaching puppeteering now uh, with, when in video is going to be uh, quite, quite the uh, experience. So that's, uh, that's my specialty. Yeah, Great. mostly. Thank you. Thank you, you and Benny. Uh, Nancy. Hi, I'm Nancy Nybert. I am currently working with Theater of Hearts Youth First. I am an artist mentor in dramatic arts and storytelling. This past semester, I started out live, had a little bit of a lull, and then suddenly was thrust into virtual storytelling. Great, great. Allison Tuthill. Hi, everyone. I'm Allison Tuthill. I work with Education Through Music Los Angeles. I have been an educator going into my 11th year. Started off in New York City, and now I'm here in LA. And I teach at two different schools, one in South Central, one in Elysian Valley. And I teach pre-K or TK to sixth grade. And I'm also a supervisor, so I mentor new teachers that are interns with us, and also some seasoned teachers, giving them feedback on their practice and helping them with their curriculum writing. Great. Um, uh, let's go to Sarah. Hi everyone, Sarah Demister, and I'm trained as an artist, a visual painter and actor. And I kind of fell into teaching um, and I got hired uh, on a full-time basis at a French American school, teaching all classes in French, uh, in all subjects from French to math to history, geography. And I am, not so secretly bringing in the arts in my teaching and it's been going really well. And I got hired a couple weeks before we transitioned online. So I've been on this a really exciting adventure, um, helping the school uh, become an, a remote school. And, and uh, in parallel, I've been developing with my creative and business partner, uh, Lucid World, which, is, which offer courses, educational courses in virtual reality in collaboration with mostly teaching artists. Great. Uh, Lauren? Buddy, I'm Lauren Kling. I've been with uh, Young Lauren, Story could Lauren, could you raise your volume a little bit? Because it's, it's a little Sure, low. is this better? Is this better if I'm closer to the mic? Yeah, it is. All right. Uh, my name is Lauren Kling. I'm a mentor with Young Storytellers. I've been with them for six years. Um, I last fall and in, into the new year, I was a head mentor for their junior high program, uh, but was working as a mentor with their fifth grade students, the script to stage, uh, when the pandemic started. And so we got to finish out online. 
Okay, Carmel. Ah, yeah. Hi, I'm Carmel, and I am a graduate of the uh, Actors Fund program. And I often use my, ta my art teaching to work at museums. Uh, there are a lot of museums that um, nowadays put in some curriculum so that they um, have something as well as their patrons. And so um, we were, that hasn't gone virtual. But um, I do have, uh, I'm also a children's book author and illustrator. And so I've had a chance to do a little bit of, um, I've, I've used that there as well, and mm -hmm. being a visiting artist. Great. And we'll go over to Valerie. Hello, my name is Valerie Dauphin. And I have two parallel careers, actually. One is as a the dancing life coach, the dancing confidence coach, actually. And that combines um, work as a published author, life coaching, and dance. And I've created these dance shops, which is a hybrid coaching and movement workshop. And uh, the main reason why I'm here today is for my other career as a dance educator. And so uh, because of the career center at the Actors Fund, which I'm immensely grateful for, that's the reason why I have this career. And so right now, um, I've worked with several organizations, but in terms of the virtual aspect, I've been working at Gabriella Charter Schools for the last three years. I'm currently the company director for the after school dance program. The kids have to audition and we do a bunch of performances throughout the year. And I'm also a dance instructing artist. And we were face to face for a while and then COVID hit. And I, so I'm excited to share with you how I've been able to expand what we were doing in person to all virtual. Great, that's so exciting. And I love that there's different disciplines here, you know, that we're talking about and that makes it even more interesting for our conversation. Um, so why don't we start out with, um, what's, been, what's been exciting? Let's start out here. What's been exciting about going into a virtual platform that has, has really intrigued you and, and made you maybe think a little bit more creatively than you might have? I'd love to start. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought it would be you. <laughs> the fascinating thing is what I find exciting now was actually pretty stressful at the time it was happening. And so um, at, at the school, we short, the, the shorthand is GCS. We have an end of year performance and that's usually on a stage in person and this is dance, right? So COVID hit, um, how are, are we going to do, what is this gonna look like? So we ended up putting together the first ever virtual arts festival, which we um, did a webinar for essentially in, in May. And my role, okay, so usually I'm used to choreographing and teaching in person. So I'm very, thank goodness, I'm incredibly comfortable with Zoom and was before um, COVID happened. And so having to translate, like I said, it was stressful at the time, but looking back at it, having had that under my belt, it's pretty exciting and going into this new school year. So translating um, use of heavy use of technology, teaching the choreography, um, ha having, having virtual rehearsals, having the students send me back videos of them doing the choreography so that I can make adjustments. And then at the end, receiving 15, 20, from tw 15 to 20 different students, I can't tell, I don't know, maybe it was 100 plus videos so that we could edit it together and create a short film instead of in person. That was an undertaking. Um, my skill set, what I'm really the most excited about is how I was able to expand my skill set from a dance company director, a dance instructing artist to now a short film director. <laughs> and, you know, working with an editor and creating this massive shot list and going through each and every, meticulously going through each and every single one of these videos and saying from here to here, cut that, put it there. And it was wow. But at the end to see and to have this piece of work now, it's truly amazing. I'm gonna end there. 
That's, that's very exciting. That's really, really exciting. And I'm trying to visually see how you're ma managing to do that. Aren't you guys? I mean, I'm trying to figure out how do you show that? Because it's like enough to really even just show this part of our body, you know, and, and get the point across. But we'll talk more about that as we move along. Anybody else? I think Allison might have some interesting things about, you know, because music is a whole other thing, too. Uh, you want to speak about it, like the difference? between going from uh, being a teacher, uh, you know, directly in person versus doing it virtually and teaching music that way? Well, I have to agree with Valerie. I think it's a good challenge, right? It's a, it, it made all of us step outside of our comfort zone, learn new technologies we maybe weren't as proficient in. Um, my school did a talent show. And so before COVID, we had a rehearsal every day or every Tuesday. And the kids would come and they would get in their little groups and practice and I would kind of supervise. And then COVID happened. It was like, all right, what's going to happen now? And they, they did the same similar format where they filmed videos and I became an iMovie master, right? I think teaching, it, it makes you rethink, how am I going to do this, right? Kids can't really sing chorally anymore because Zoom won't allow us. So it's a lot of me just kind of singing into the void and watching their mouths and oh I, I hear you through my bedroom window i hear you singing sing louder and those kind of things but it's it's definitely a transition and you know i see what i really like is that i see a lot of families join in and they wouldn't have been able to do that when i was in the school right mm -hmm. i wouldn't see mom or baby brother and so i've had a lot of parents who just kind of wander into the screen they're holding up their baby watching me <laughs> or you know older brother comes and he starts playing the game with little sister so i really like that like i feel like even though we're all separated the community feels stronger right right so there's a lot of interaction that's happening in the homes that you're being able yeah, to. Yeah, it feels good to promote that. How oh, fabulous. How about for you, Nancy? Cause you kind of like all of a sudden you had to kind of pull it together fairly, fairly quickly, right? Yes. Now I had been teaching the fable, the tortoise and the hare. This is the one about the race where suddenly the hare pulls ahead and becomes the winner of the race, which is a surprise to kids that the story kind of changes in the middle. I was teaching a lot of woodland animals, so we had been exploring movement, and suddenly we were reduced to paws or claws. So we found a lot of ways to express that. And in fact, our final day, we played a game called paws or claws or wings or hooves and managed to get everything going where we reread the story. We read some of our books. I occasionally would bring along a mask that eventually, you know, we would have, can you identify this? Oh, that's an owl. And you can tell it's a nighttime creature because of the big wide whites of the eyes that help it see. So we were able to project what they might have been acting out instead by creating games with it. Great, great. Um, I'm gonna go to you, Bruce. Uh, and I know that with you, you've been doing these videos, which, which is something, by the way, is another area that people have been doing is creating vid videos that, that can be used by the teachers and all of that. Right. But can you speak to what that experience was for you, putting that stuff together? <sighs> It was hard. Uh, I was I was literally four days away uh, in the Sulphur Springs School District doing uh, about to teach puppeteering in a three um, a, a lesson uh, series, mm -hmm. and I had a whole lot of ideas and I had a lot of bag of tricks, uh, and I I uh, I was about to do it, of course, and then we got again shut down by COVID, and um, I didn't really know what I was going to do next. Uh, I did approach Bunny. Hull uh, at our graduation ceremony uh, to talk with her and uh, for future things. And I was perhaps going to go into classroom, but she called up and said, you know, she has, has this amazing program uh, and I have to distill everything down that I really wanted to say or teach about puppeteering into 11 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea how to do that. So, you know, it's like reducing a sauce. You boil it down and boil it down and you really want to make it you know, uh, succinct because you only have uh, just mere minutes to get to bridge all of the things about the art form that would be pertinent. And the biggest challenge was they didn't have a puppet. Sure, I could say, go get a sock from, you know, your drawer, but you put on a sock, it's not a puppet and it, and it doesn't have a mouth. And then putting eyes on it, 
may you know ruin the sock. I don't know if they need that sock. It may be mommy's sock, and you don't want to do that to mommy. So uh, I, I had to scramble because I'm, a, I'm not a builder. I work with amazing builders throughout my career, beautiful art forms and people who, who did this all their lives, but I was the performer. So not having really built a puppet, I had to re, you know, look in on the internet and find a solution. And so I just thought about it for a second and uh, I had some three by five cards around and I said, how can I make a three by five card you know, into a puppet peeper? Because I, I purchased puppet peepers for you know, 800 students, which I have. And if anybody needs them, please call me. I need to unload them. Uh, but what I did was I took this and, and somehow in one minute, I told them how to fold it. And then I created you know, this, where you can take it and put it onto your finger and then we can do puppet exercises together. So you can, you know, whatever you have around the house, you can just basically uh, make whatever you wanted. So I needed to make sure they had the eyes because puppeteering is all about the eyes, isn't it? It sure is. So basically, how to distill down and do something for the kids that they can practice because puppeteering is talking to yourself. It's self-communication. Mm -hmm. So I needed to, you know, have them tap into it. I needed to distill down for myself what it is that I do which is really talking to yourself, self-love, the voice inside yourself that you need to go forward because being isolated, especially from your friends, what you have is what you can create is a new puppet friend. And then you have somebody, oh yes, to talk to, to sing with and to create with. So that's where I'm going. So this time in mixed blessings, that arrow is very clear, giving the permission for them to do funny voices, to, to sing out loud, and, and to have fun in the mirror with themselves and with their puppet pal. And also to be able to create their own puppets, you know, like that. Absolutely. It's the beginning of creation. Yeah, yeah you that's, know? that's so exciting. Really yeah. exciting. Sarah, um, it's very exciting because I know, I'm so glad you're doing the French and you found your way through that because you, you know, just, just talk to us a little bit about, you know, what this has been like and being able to bring some of our artistry into the classroom. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for having me today. I'm thrilled to be part of the discussion, <clears throat> and I hope it helps. Whatever I say, I hope it helps. Um, if you have specific questions, don't hesitate. Um, you know, I, I love a, a good problem, that's for sure. And um, I had, as I mentioned, I had been hired two weeks before the lockdown, so I got to meet the kids for two weeks. We were in the same room. We got to know each other a little bit, and then we were uh, <laughs> stuck at home. And you know, I have to say, I, 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 it really boosted my creativity because I really had to find, I think we had two days as, uh, as teachers to, to just, you know, offer these online classes to our, I had 15 students in my class. Uh, they were in uh, third grade. We were in third, four, uh, sorry, fourth grade. I have, I have third next year, uh, fourth grade. And um, I, I really used my acting chops to engage them you know, my voice, not to be, uh, you know, not to, I, I didn't want to, I couldn't be monotonous, not, not that I am naturally, but I really, I really worked on how I was saying things, um, what I was showing. Um, I, you know, math or f f the study of the French language can seem a bit boring. And there was, you know, in class, I can, I can teach with my whole body. Uh, we can sing things. It wasn't as easy on, um, on Zoom, but what I did was I brought them into virtual reality, for example. Um, so I, I had my, uh, my co-founder co of Lucid putting on the headset, and he's, he's in Mexico, so he's got the headset on, and he's sharing, he's, he's in my classroom um, sharing what he sees, and then I guide him into, um, teach, into my Ge geometry lesson, for example. So the children would see a you know, 360 version of geometry and they really could understand things at a different level and it really engaged them. Engaged them. So it was, it was finding these ways to, to really keep them on this, you know, this little screen that they had at home. Um, also, um, I, you know, I, I, had a, I have one little puppet left from my childhood so of course, oh here he is. Can uh, he's blue, so he's I have blue screen, so he I can't <laughs> remember him. But he, you know, he is a huge asset to to my teaching for um for the younger kids, and um 
it really, really helped me a lot to have this little guy um, laying around. And also, you know, one thing that I, I realized is I was now into in their home, you know, so there was, it really created a lot of intimacy with the children that I, that I didn't have at, 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 at school. You know, they could show me their room, they could show, you know, of course, yeah, their family was around. And that created a, a bond, a special bond between us, especially that I, you know, I've only known them for a couple of weeks, more or less. So that was, that was really special. And then I got to discover, you know, Minecraft and Roblox. I, you know, I would play with them on during our breaks. And, and that was also, you know, entering their world. So it was, it made, you know, the important thing was during this lockdown was connection and, and finding creative ways to, to learn. And great, great. Well, they say that, you know, we, we don't change because we see the light. We change, we don't say, we don't change because we feel the heat. We change, no, I'm wrong. We don't change because we see the light. We change because we feel the heat, right? right. So that when we're in situations which are very, very difficult, it forces us to really think of better ways to be able to survive and to get to the other side of it. So that's great. Uh, I want to go over to Lauren, because uh, you've been doing what you've been doing for quite a while, for over six years. Right. And, uh, of course, you're working with Young Storytellers, which we had on our panel earlier. Do you want to speak to that transition and uh, the, some of the, the, the aha moments you've had? Sure. First off, I got to thank Bruce. Every time he pulls out a puppet or a Muppet, I turn into a kid again. <laughs> so uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being an easy audience. I appreciate it. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm easily entertained. But part of that, <clears throat> what was interesting is the transition to Zoom-based meetings for young storytellers was like being a kid because it was mm. myself and nine other teaching artists or mentors. And for the fifth grade program, Script to Stage, you work one-on-one -on -one with a student. So when we were in the classroom, it would be 10 mentors, 10 fifth graders, and we would work with them in groups and individually to help them write a five-page movie script. And then at the end, we'd invite their classmates and parents to watch actors perform these scripts, kind of cold read them on stage. So uh, I wasn't involved in building or transitioning the programming. As a mentor uh, for the fifth grade program, I'm just, I'm learning how to work with the students on Zoom, which has been fun, but it's also been fun to work with the other mentors, teaching artists, kind of felt like being back in college where you kind of had to figure out, all right, <clears throat> how do we do this? This is fun. Let's stay up all day and drink sodas uh, and then we'll make this work. So that part was a lot of fun. You know, of course, you're concerned with can the students, uh, do they have internet at home? Do they have computers? Can they be there? Yeah. I'm happy that we had, I think, all nine, if not 10 of our students who were able to complete the program. And then for the... Um, live show, we had actors and they performed uh, on Zoom and some of them performed while sitting down, some of them performed while standing up. I think it was, I think it was wonderful. So it really worked out and I'm so happy that Young Storytellers really took on the role of transitioning during the middle of the programming. And you guys have a very, very um structured training you know for for getting on there it's not they don't just throw you out into the field they really they really take you through a very um because i saw i saw the video uh of what's what the training looked like um do you, you want to speak to that at all sure now i can speak to the training as far as the junior high program uh, a couple of years ago they started testing a program for eighth graders uh, where the students, a classroom would write soliloquies, one page soliloquies. And if we can think back to our junior high years, probably the most tumultuous, scary part of our childhood. Um, so I was a head mentor. So I was testing with two, I think two other people to test these programs. So I can only speak on the training before COVID for this program, which was already really good. Um, they already had it laid out. I worked in this small group with the um, 
with multiple people at Young Storytellers who would develop these programs. And so I don't know if we're going to do this program in the fall, but I am already sure and comfortable with that if we do it, it will work out. Great. Yeah. So I want to move over to uh, Carmel, you know, because your, your experience, you've been working with museums and all of that. And you want to just talk a little bit about what you've experienced? Well, I, I uh, think the exciting thing for me is to think that, um, and we were thinking about this before, but we just didn't get to it, was to be able to provide a little space at some point in a museum as a visual artist and trying to help people understand the um, exhibit they're in. You know, we'll have um, activities that sometimes are hands-on and craft oriented. And then I could actually do a video and that could be there along with the, um, with the supplies. And, I, and we don't have to have the docents fully trained in order to help people with that. So that was a really exciting thought. And, 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 and um, that was uh, um, something we had thought about a lot of museums. If you, if you do go see some of those exhibits, they will have an area where they have videos for um, people to understand, books to look at, and some space that if you brought a child, if it's appropriate, that they can interact and and kind of expand as well as students, you know, classrooms come to the, to um, many of the museums these days. And it's nice to send them home or send them back to the classroom with something for them to do as well. Right. So and have, you been, have you been working with them virtually on, at the museums? Has that happened yet at all? Not yet. It's, uh, um, we started to look at the, the reality that um, by the time we had we had pushed many of the projects off to the summer of next year or, or the uh, you know uh, this fall and now we know that's not going to work so they're really trying to figure out how to um, continue to uh, have the patrons see them and. Um, I think that that's a lot for them right now. <laughs> I noticed that one one of the um, museums, not a, uh, not that I'm connected with, actually invited penguins in, and they had you know so many hits of these penguins wandering through, looking at the art. So it's it's we'll see. But I I feeling as I'm here that actually there's some things I could offer back that they may not have thought of. Great, terrific. And um, let me just see. Uh, let's let's go into some uh, you some of you talked a little bit about challenges but i'd like to see if anybody wants to say anything about any challenges any anything any problem solving that you found you had to do you, you went in thinking you were going to do it this way and you had to walk out you ended up having to do it differently on the you know like you were right there and mm -hmm. this is the show must go on you know mm -hmm. how, how, how any of you might have handled any of those moments i i can start okay so in addition to my regular role that I already shared before during the school year, uh, we had a summer school enrichment program for three weeks. And I was one of the instructors, I was the dance instructor for that program. And that involved me creating two different classes from scratch <laughs> and teaching that. And I had different grade levels. Um, one of the challenges was attendance. Mm -hmm. and, and, and engagement, engagement slash attendance. Mm -hmm. And so there were two things that I needed to shift. One was, okay, so the way that I originally had mapped out this curriculum is not, needs some tweaks. And so I needed to be flexible and go back and adjust the, depending on who was showing up. The other thing I needed to shift was my mindset. And so my, my, you know, instead of, oh, you know, maybe it was a downer for one of the classes that only two people showed up. And instead it was, you know, and I touched on this with my, um, the person I was reporting to over the summer, hey, these people showed up. Like, let me put all of my energy and attention on them. Um, aside from the summer school, you know, engagement across the board was an issue, not just for me, but for many students. And so part, excuse me, other, other teachers. And so, 
you know, just, just discussing, like not having to feel like it's all on me to figure out, but talking about solutions with my colleagues. That was another way of, uh, of handling that challenge. Right. Yeah. And that's one thing actually that goes with Lauren was talking about learning how to work together with other teaching artists to get ideas, you know, because uh, that I, because we're all we're all in the same boat together, right? And we have to kind of figure it out as nobody's like ahead of anybody, you know, we're all figuring it out as we go along. So that's a really good point. Go ahead, uh, Sarah. So uh, the, 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 the challenge was actually the solution because in the beginning I was, I was like, okay, I'm the teacher here. I really got to get this e class together. And so I thought, okay, I have to have to have a really, you know, a strong structure and we're going to go this way and do that. And in, in fact, that doesn't work. And what happened is I got to give the children, the students, much more autonomy and agency. And they led the class. And, and when they led the class, the class went beautifully. They knew. They guided me. And that was, that was magic. And that's something I, in the classroom, I've always enjoyed doing is really listening to the students. How do you like to learn? What do you want to learn? How do you, you know, like, where are we going? And and it gives them a lot of confidence. Mm -hmm. And I got to do that so much more in, um, in, on a virtual level because it was just them and me really, because you know, everyone's in separate rooms, <laughs> in separate uh, yeah, spaces. So the, it, it, it ended up being a lot of one-on-ones really. Mm -hmm. and, and that was um, really beneficial for their growth and, and, and their confidence. And I could go very far with them in a little, in a short amount of time, mm -hmm. and yeah, and just giving them the autonomy, you know, especially in fourth grade where they're going into fifth and then sixth, it was really a great time to um to let them guide their learning. And and it's also like a tutorial, you know, giving them a little bit of a tutorial experience with with the lesson. Yes. Well, one speaking of tutorial, the one thing I'm going to be doing in my, for my the first first two weeks of uh, teaching third grade is how to use the computer. And, and the programs on the computer, because this is like, you know, this, this is our new way of, of communicating. Mm -hmm. And, um, and if, if we don't have that base, that foundation, then we, we can't move, move forward. So I'm integrating that in, into my program and I'll make it as, as fun as possible, but definitely that's something that I'll have to add. Great. Any other uh, people, uh, any, Hans? go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm blessed to be in a family of teachers. My, my wife, Laura, is a teacher, and my sister-in-laws, uh, Lisa and Jill, they also teach. And I, I did a, a little bit uh, with uh, my sister Jill's um, third grade class. And, um, you know, you, you, see all, you, 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 know, you see all the blocks of kids, and, and they're, just, they're just melted down, and they're exhausted. But they are listening. And um, uh, I was surprised when I, you know, presented all the puppet stuff and I, I even tried to do Menomina, do, 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 and I couldn't, the music, and it didn't translate, so I had to switch gears. But I thought, maybe I didn't get through, you know, I showed them the stuff, it was fun for a little while. And then two days later, Jill says, uh, there was a video by one of the children that made a puppet, and they did a whole entire show because uh, they were, of course, seeded by the idea, and they exploded, and they never did a puppet before that time. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, they are listening. That was in the first part of this whole symposium, is that they're always listening. They're soaking it up. They have nothing to soak up at home. And mm -hmm. sometimes they're in a room that, that has terrible sound, terrible tech, and there's nowhere else to go. Many kids don't have a special place and a special, special equipment to, to be able to focus. And they don't know where the camera is. We forget that. We look at the camera, we talk to them, and we're making eye contact, you know? So teaching them with the camera is very important. So, you know, when I have a, when I have a puppet and I can come right to the camera and let's all touch noses whoop, and do things like that, suddenly yeah. there's a game to happen. And something I also learned from my wife, she said, uh, try a scavenger hunt. Give them four minutes to go away and bring something back. So have something soft, something blue, you know, something delicious, and then make a story out of it or uh, a song or, or dance with it. And, and suddenly animate what you have. It, it, it's situational. So be in the moment and let the kids speak because where else can they talk? You know, I mean, talking to a screen is a cold thing and you think you're not communicating, but listening, us listening in a different way is so crucial. And we're all learning to listen differently and listen together. Yeah, and I think right now with the shelter, 
uh, being in shelter, you know, there, there is a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, the level of isolation people are experiencing and, uh, and the relief, you know, being able to make those kind of connections, you know, creatively is wonderful. Anybody else want to speak about? Uh, yes. Yeah, go I'd love to chime in. Um, I, I love what I'm hearing. I think I, great minds think alike right now. Um, a big feedback that I got or that administration gave all teachers at the end of the year was, you know, kids feel silenced a little bit right now. You know, they can't just kind of shout out like when they're sick of waiting for you, you know, to kind of shout out their answer. Like they can't do that, especially if you've disabled the, the mute button, right? So I think I agree. It's, it's take time, take more time than you might have in the classroom to stop and hear individual voices, right? Letting them have autonomy of what's happening next. Um, and then with the engagement piece, I agree. It's, it, as the educator, it feels really disappointing when I'm ready to go. And then only five kids of my 35, wow. you know, kid classroom showed up and you do have to change that mindset of, of like, you know, is this not good? So one thing I started doing was like previewing next time, right? By saying, you know, next time I see you, you're going to need, you know, go that scavenger hunt, right? You're going to need some markers, you're going to need a piece of paper and kind of like previewing, this is what we're going to do to get them excited. And I found that I had a lot more returners, right? A lot more kids on top of it coming back and seeing them again. So that could be something that works for you. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like, um, kind of like when you watch, you know, it, when you watch a show and a TV show and it's like, what makes you, or if you, if you ever binge anything, you know, you watch the end of it and it's like, oh my God, I gotta go to the next one because I gotta find out what's gonna happen. Teasers. Uh, right. Cliffhanger. Yeah. yeah, the cliffhangers, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's really what you're talking about. That's great. That's terrific. Uh, anybody else want to speak to this? Yes, go ahead, Carmel. Um, Yes, I, um, so I am being more of a visitor in the classroom. So the teachers, they're doing a lot of it. I um, we realized that um, providing, because I, I, as a visual artist, I was going to do, uh, and a pop-up engineer, I was going to do pop-ups and um, providing them with the a video so that the kids could go back and look at it or, or do it again later. I, I, <laughs> I uh, had to figure out, okay, well, I put this here and put my phone here and, and I, that I could actually do it with the, the small things that I have, my, my video, my phone and, you know, my computer. And I also got a chance to hear myself teach and edit it and just get it right, which was a big um, gift to myself. Actually, do you, do you want to show a piece of that video? Do you, do you have it? I on? would love to. Yeah, I, I, I asked. Uh, I actually, uh, because this is something that Carmel has done. She's been visiting to different classes and all of that, but then okay. providing videos because that's another way of. Uh, Are of you seeing it? Can you pull it up? Are you seeing it? I, you seeing I'm, there, uh, I'm doing it now. Okay, so it's just you a sharing your screen. Okay. Yeah. Hi, so the things that you're going to need for this project are paper, at least three pieces, some glue stick, something to draw with and mark with, a pencil or a pen. This one's erasable. Scissors and a ruler if you can, and we need some tape. So the things you'll need. Hi, and welcome to Fun with Pop-Ups. Um, fun with Geometry and Pop-Ups. We're gonna do a parallelogram pop-up today where we make this wonderful shape. Now you can have your pop-up go this way, or you can have it go this way. So. How they are, this one has two. So I don't know if that's enough. No, that, that, I think you're giving that idea. Great, thank you. Yeah. But I think uh, that's very exciting. You can um, close, yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I just wanna give that as an ex example because I know a lot with uh, visual art, it's helpful for them to have a video to be able to work with. And that way they can roll it back too, you know, like that if they don't understand something. I don't know how you are, but I I'm used to recording things and, and, and you know, we, that when I'm in the car and I hear something on NPR, I want, I, I always think, oh, there's going to be a button there where I can, you know, go back because I didn't hear exactly what they said. 
that your mind is that way. So I imagine kids are really in that kind of space. And, and I think it, it also, it, I decided at some point at the beginning of this, I wanted to learn how to knit better. So mm -hmm. I started looking at videos like that. And it was really helpful for me to kind of get a chance to, to do what my students were going to do. So. Right, right. Well, that's great. That, that was, uh, that's what inspired you to, to really <laughs> to make it new, new and different soon. Thanks. Great. Anybody else in the, in the area of uh, needing a challenge? Uh, just, just to Very quickly, I did not have a technological challenge, but I did have uh, young kids working from home, sometimes with another sibling right beside them doing different schoolwork. So each was wearing headphones. And we decided for our final class, we were going to go to the International Space Station. So we put on our harnesses, we put on our helmets, we flipped some switches, we did some dials, and we took off. And I used a few virtual backgrounds of the Aurora Borealis. And I said, look at that. That's that same sunlight that helps grow your plants. And then there's that great shot of the light coming over the moon. And I said, and that's that very same light coming from the sun. So I was able to generate more excitement. And the kids never knew that they didn't have a final performance. I had never told them in a COVID world when it started in February that we might be going toward one or might not. But we managed to make something special. We managed to stay in our chairs and managed to respect the other members in the household with a lot of different seated pantomime exercises and games. That's great. That's great. Wonderful. And Bruce, you wanted to speak on this as well? Yeah, I just, uh, you know, a lot of people don't have uh, all uh, Carmela's beautiful setup and everything, but sometimes people don't have, you know, all of those things at handy, especially on short notice. So, you know, giving them options, you know, just for, you know, for the, what I needed to do with this, attaching, you know, you have tape or, or a paper clip or whatever you can find. And whatever you can find is so important because uh, making somebody feel bad that they can't participate because they don't have what they need. Right. Uh, you know, it, it, in school, it's a challenge, but let alone at home where you're, at, you're asking your parents even more. Uh, so it's, it's better to try to make it so they can access what they can and, and still participate. So. Great. So I'm going to just go into the some of the, because we have some really good questions that have been asked in the Q&A, and I want to respect that. So, and this is a really important one because it's it's a it's it's really an issue. I'm going to be talking to my friends over at uh, uh, Gabriella Foundation because they've always done our classroom management, you know, with us uh, for the last few years. Um, but how are people dealing with behavioral disciplinary uh, issues in um, the virtual classroom? I mean, have things come up for any of you that you had to? How, how are you managing that? I actually haven't had any issues. I, for if anything, it has reduced drastically because we're on in a virtual space now. And what I will say is, for the summer school class, because I'll several most of these students were students that I had never taught. Well, I've taught them before, but not in a consistent setting. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's expectations, like managing expectations and setting just setting the stage from before we even had the first class. So we had videos and then we had live sessions. And in my, the video before the live session, you know, I shared here what the expectations are. And this is what happened when you meet them and this is what happened when you don't. And then when we first, when the, the first day before ever diving into content, talking about those expectations and like I said, I didn't need, I didn't need to use behavioral management because A, I had, you know, I had Zoom room control. So, which I didn't really, I didn't really need to, you know, use crazily. However, when there are certain parts, so, okay, here's an example. I was teaching the, the storybook dance class. So combining storybook with dance and I uh, had my K through two students and they get really excited, lots of energy. And so there are certain parts as I'm instructing, Miss Valerie, Miss Valerie, um, I have something I want to share. You know, I was like, I so want to hear this. <laughs> and I need to get through this blah, blah. So I kind of like test the waters before doing a universal mute. 
And if it was getting too, too much interruption, I just do a global mute. And then the way that I instruct the class is I facilitate more than instruct. And so that means I, I want to hear, I, there's engagement, there's back and forth. So there's never, a, there's never a class where that mute button is gonna be happening for the whole thing. But that's, that's really the only management that I needed to use. And I've taught a lot of students over the last month virtually. Right. Great. This has definitely been something that I've been working with as I mentor our teachers at UTMLA and do it myself. Mm -hmm. I think a big piece is, again, yes, setting your expectations just like you would in the classroom. You have your classroom rules. You have your online rules, right? And what we find acceptable and what we agree to together. And so you have that maybe as like a little list as a PowerPoint and you have it up on your computer and you're ready to share it on your screen. If we need to revisit up, oh, these are our group norms. Um, I taught a little summer camp that we did right when school ended. And so I had a co-teacher with that. So it was nice because I got to almost just be the facilitator while he was teaching. And that's where I really got to get into the management aspect where we had a student who, you know, one of our norms was your camera's on and we see your face in the screen, right? Like you're not, you know, like this, like they like to do, like they're, they're texting on their phone, right? And they're like hiding from you. So while he was teaching, I was able to kind of message that student privately, right? Or, or even move her into a breakout room real quick and say, you know, our norms are, we, we have our eyes on the camera. And she was funny because when she would have her head down, I started to kind of just casually unmute her while the other teacher was teaching. You could hear a YouTube video playing on her computer. So she's over here on YouTube while we're running a class. And so it's just really being open and asking, you know, student, I see that you're not with us in the class, you know, come back and join us. And if it needs to be a conversation with mom where, you know, I think student could be a little more engaged in class, you know, it, it might be that where you're reaching out to a parent and you're kind of getting them involved in it. When you're doing your, your, you know, the rules, I mean, we do that with training with adults, certainly. Uh, are they part of that, that putting those rules together? Um, older kids, definitely, because yeah. that was kind of where I was touching on before is they want to be heard, right? And they're, they're, this is the perfect way to universally mute them and they just feel kind of trapped. I once entered another teacher's classroom where she had the universal mute on and there was a student going like this the whole time because she was like, I have something to say. So as soon as I got my turn to teach, you know, I kind of unmuted her right away. It's like, what do you want to tell us? You know, so I think, yeah, letting them be involved in that process. Definitely. And keep it short, right? Like four rules or less is really all you need. Yeah. Yeah. So there's some clarity in that respect. Anybody else on that particular topic, you know, about, about the behavioral things that might come up? Um, this, I think, would go a little bit toward Lauren. Because um, somebody's saying they're currently a full-time teaching artist with early, in the early years, with early years, but want uh, to transition into flexibility of being a teaching artist. My focus is theater and I enjoy working with early years. Any tips? I'm just wondering in terms of the work you've been doing, because Young Storytelling is, Tellers is, um, I know it's volunteer work, but can you just sort of speak to how much that has enriched you in terms of any kind of teaching artist work you might want to be able to do and giving you kind of the resume, you know, to be able to go out there and do it? Uh, I think it was either mentioned here or in the morning session about going out and volunteering. Mm -hmm. And I, and you know, it just is one of those things where a friend says, Hey, I'm doing this cool thing. You want to try it. And you tell yourself as an actor or a voice actor or a host or whatever you do, how can I be creative outside of auditions and booking jobs? And so Young Storytellers was just an opportunity to do that, to, to be in a room where you could teach as an adult, work with students and use your skills. Um, of course, being able to uh, become a head mentor and actually lead a class for young storytellers last year kind of was a transition, you know, kind of, are you ready to, do you want to do this, Lauren? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, I think it's, really gives me a perspective on a world I had no idea about beforehand. Um, for last year, for a few months, I'd worked for a for-profit company that does after-school enrichment, basically uh, doing programs for hour, an hour at a time at different schools. And that's K through six. And what I learned in four months is I don't want to work with kids K through six. I, at least for me personally, while I love those kids, I found that uh, 
I was less of a teacher and more of just handling the kids that were out of line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think even that learned saying to myself, okay, I know what I love to do. I love to work with junior high kids because sometimes I still feel like I am that junior high kid, that eighth grade Lauren. And there are some grades I don't want to learn. So it's, uh, it's an ongoing process, but certainly enlightening. Right. Um, I, I think that's really important being aware of, you know, getting out there, doing it and finding out who you should be teaching and who you shouldn't be teaching. You know, it's, it's a very important piece. Um, I used to be one of those, when I, when I did do a little bit of teaching and even arts education, I thought I'd be really good with the little kids because I love little kids, but I found I was much better with fifth, sixth, seventh graders because I, I don't know, it was just like a better better place for me to be able to communicate. That's, that's what I learned. Um, but there's, there is a question in there about your training. Now I know of, of um, uh, there's seven of you here and, and six of you, I know where you got some of your training. Um, but I wanna just speak to that, why it's important to get training, to be a teaching artist. There, right now in, at least, in, in, I, I think this is national, it's not just the state of California, there is no formal certification. You know, we, we definitely give certification of completion with our teaching artist program, but there's not a, you know, certification from the county or certification from uh, LAUSD. Can we speak a little bit about how training, what are, the training that you had has helped you to get out there and do what you need to do? And continuous training too. It doesn't have to be just the back you know, when you started with your teaching artist program, but other training or conferences or ways that you keep it fresh and uh, really lay it down. Um, so can, who would like to speak on that? Training was essential for me for knowing how to design curriculum. And that was one of the biggest things. So for me, it was lear learning how to design curriculum and also the behavior management aspect. Those two, having those two, feeling confident about those two, before I was at GCS, I was at several other teaching artist organizations. And having that skill set under in my wheelhouse, I felt confident just going to the hiring manager or whoever and said, hey, I have this, you know, this proposal. Are you accepting um, teaching artists right now? And I've, I've designed workshops before for my business and other aspects, but, you know, knowing how to design for the school setting and being comfortable with VAPA standards or Common Core and knowing that terminology, it just set me, I feel like I've gotten interviews, if not jobs, because I was speaking the language of education. Great, great. Anybody else want to speak to that about the training that you've received? Uh, uh, Sarah? No, for me, it was all about the community, you know, knowing, meeting the other teachers, meeting my mentors, um, seeing what others are doing, connecting with them to create something new. Um, yeah, continue uh, finding out what's what's going on, maybe something I missed, something I'm not aware of, um, and really continuing to build community and, uh, as, you know, a powerful one, because I think, you know, we're up next in a big, in a big way. Right. Right, that's really important. The community is a big piece of it. Anybody mm -hmm. else? Okay. Yeah, I, I, I've got to tout the Actors Fund. It was a year ago today, obviously, that uh, I was at the Wallace, and I, I walked into this, you know, this beautiful theater, uh, and, and hoping, you know, I don't know what I was hoping for. I was hoping for something fresh in my life. You know, my art form is, it, it got a little stale. I, I, I didn't know what I was doing next, uh, and I know I wanted to do more because I've done other things, but seeing the community and feeling and hearing words uh, that were so much deeper and so rooted in, in, in the why that we do our art and the connectivity, because we're so competitive with each other and we're always auditioning or we're worried about so many things other than the doing of the art. And then does the art land? And then is the art making us uh, a living? And all of those pressures and now, of course, those house of cards have just come down. So I, I, I implore you, if, if you're listening to this and, and, you, and you, you, you tuned in and you're wondering if you can be a teacher, you can, you can, because it comes from your heart. It comes from the things you do. You get to 
break down your art form and find out why you're doing what you're doing and, and, and what made you excited and, and the childlike you know, innocence and joy that you can bring that I brought to you in the beginning, perhaps it's, it's not there now, it gets rekindled. That flame does not go out. So it's really important to get the training and get the confidence for something that you think, oh, I can't, I can't, you know? And it's not a performance. The main thing is it's not about you when you're teaching. It's about them. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the energies that go back and forth, it's all there for you to, to plug into. Allow that to not be worried about the final product. It's not even a product. It's a process that never ends and everybody needs. And that may change a life. So don't hesitate to go to the Actors Fund and dive in. Great. Anybody else? I, I don't know how we, we can talk that. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, if Bruce is going to plug Actors Fund, I have to say something about education through Music Los Angeles. We are always looking for educators that are ready to jump into the classroom and, you know, share that love. Like Bruce said, you, you realize, oh, this is why I love music. Like this is when I was a kid, I loved going to music class. And now you're that teacher that they look forward to every week. Um, we get professional development five times a year. You have like a mentor like myself who goes to your classroom and supports you in writing curriculum, supports you in classroom management. So education through music is a great place for you to kind of get your feet wet and also get that support right along the way. 